Good morning, folks. I think I'll, I'll slowly get started here. Um, my name is Guido. I live in Vermont on the shores of Lake Champlain. And I um, am really great, uh, grateful to be here at the Soil and Nutrition Conference this year. I want to spend some time talking to you about um, what is the passion of my life, which is working with medicinal plants, and hopefully introduce you to some of my favorites. I'm going to group them into a few categories, which I think makes it a little easier to wrap my brain around the vastness of medicinal plants. And so the three categories I want to talk about, maybe we can call them four, but one is um, bitter plants, the other is aromatic plants, and the last one um, is what I call tonics, but there's some sour tonics like berries and tea and some what I'm calling sweet tonics, even though that includes mushrooms, which aren't necessarily sweet, but are just such amazing allies that even as a plant guy and herbalist, um, foraging in the forest and getting mushrooms is a big part of what we do. And there's so much research now on the medicinal qualities of mushrooms. I just wanted to share that a little bit with you all. So um, I want to introduce you to some of my favorite plants in those three categories. Talk about why herbal medicine might be a cool thing, um, something to include in your gardens or farms if you haven't thought about doing so already. And then um, talk about a couple of things that relate to the practical aspects of herbal medicine. One is quality of plants, how to assess quality, how to get a handle on making sure that our starting material for our herbal preparations are the best, and then also some practical considerations around very simple medicine making techniques. You all probably know about um, tea making, or the concept is not too foreign, but what about using alcohol to extract medicinal plants and make a tincture? or an alcohol-based extract. Um, I'll give you a really, really brief overview and a little bit of a practical demo on how to do that. It's dirt cheap and really easy and makes an herbal preparation that captures the vibrancy and freshness of plants in their native growing environment in a really good way. And then I'd also like to play around with making a infused oil and topical salve preparation. Um, really just to show you all, again, how easy it is to do this, what an amazing, cheap, homemade, effective, topical preparation for wounds and scrapes and burns you can make without having to, you know, spend 40 bucks at the store to get this, like, artisanal herbal thing. You can be your own herbal artisan, and it's really easy to do. Um, so for those of you who have taken classes with me, and I do see that some of you are back for more, even after yesterday. Um, but please interrupt me, raise your hand, um, ask your question in the moment. I don't know how much time we'll have for questions at the end, um, but if you interrupt me, we'll talk about it right then and there, and that's my favorite way to do things. So please don't be shy and uh, just raise your hand, okay? That sound good? We get to be together for about three and a half hours. Um, I think I go till about 12.30 if that's correct. And so it probably is a good idea to have a break in the middle. So around 10.30 or so, I'll, I'll try to remember to get a break going. If I don't remember, raise your hand and remind me. That would be great, OK? So um, before I really get into anything, I just want to start by making a tincture really quick. It only takes five minutes. I'll come back and talk about it a little more. But I want to start it now so I get a chance to sit around for a couple of hours before we um, look at it and taste it and smell it. OK? Does that sound good? Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. You got the clicker for me. Yeah, somebody unplugged it. They were really super helpful. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, man. So I've got two things here. Um, this is certified organic grain. Well, no, it's actually from um, sugar cane. Certified organic sugar cane that's fair traded and fermented and distilled into pure ethanol. So this is 95% ethyl alcohol or ethanol. It's the same stuff that's in vodka, um, but it's just pure like Everclear might be. The reason it can't be 100% is that alcohol is what's called deliquescent. It sucks moisture out of the air. If you ever put alcohol on your skin or like a hand sanitizer or rubbing alcohol, you know how drying it is? Just like crazy drying material. So alcohol is so drying that it actually takes moisture out of the air and stabilizes at about 95%. Um, so that's about as strong as you can get it. Then here I have water. And really, all I'm going to do is mix the alcohol and water together um, to make something that's about 150 proof. So 75% alcohol, 25% water. <clears throat> the reason I'm picking 70, yeah. You know, 
I would just say don't use municipal tap water because sometimes there's some chlorine and other residues in there. But spring water is good, distilled water is good. Um, sometimes people have special kinds of water that have been sort of ionized or alkalized. Herbalists argue about this sometimes. Um, distilled water, I say, is more thirsty because there's nothing in it at all. So it's got a little more space for extracting some minerals from the plants. But honestly, I'll tell you, it's not like spring water has a lot of minerals and salt in it. I wouldn't use seawater, but spring water is fantastic. It totally works. Um, so with alcohol, alcohol is really a fantastic solvent because it can draw out of the plant cells both constituents that dissolve in oil and also chemicals that don't dissolve in oil. So that makes it really versatile for extracting and preserving your herbal harvest. The higher you go on your alcohol percentage, the more sort of oily, resinous constituents are extracted. Anyone ever work with propolis? <clears throat> bee glue or bee resin? <sighs> that stuff is so sticky, right? Have you ever gotten it on things? It's like almost impossible to get rid of. It dissolves in pure alcohol, but about nothing else, okay? So the higher the amount of alcohol, the more towards the resin you can extract stuff. The plant that I want to uh, make a tincture or extract of is holy basil or Tulsi. Anyone heard of this plant or familiar with it? It smells really nice, right? That smell comes from volatile oils that are stored in glandular trichomes on the surface of the leaf. People talk a lot about trichomes now because everyone has gotten very into cannabis, and cannabis has trichomes, but you know, many other plants have trichomes too. And holy basil is one of those. All of those volatile oils in those trichomes, not very water soluble. So that's why we use 150 proof or 75% alcohol for that preparation. If you want to make these at home, I think there's three basic strengths of alcohol that you should have. If you don't have all three, two is fine. One is 75% alcohol, which is 150 proof, approximately. <clears throat> Bacardi 151 rum, for example. Or if you can get it, diluted Everclear, right? And Everclear or grain alcohol or pure ethanol is really versatile because you can dilute it to whatever percentage you want, like we're going to do today. 50% or 100 proof is the other strength. And then the last one, if you can get it, is something like 30 to 40 percent or 60 to 80 proof. And some vodkas or gins can be found at this percentage. Now, things like starches from roots, like if you're making a dandelion root tincture, they're going to do fine down here. Almost everything will do well here. If all you have is 100 proof vodka, that's great. Just use that. But if you've got a plant that's really aromatic, that has a lot of those volatile oils, you make a much brighter tincture and extract more of those volatiles with a higher percentage of alcohol. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a good question. Is there any reason why we wouldn't use 150 for everything? And the reason is that some of the starches and polysaccharides especially things like beta-glucans from mushrooms or oats or astragalus, they are what's called denatured or damaged by percentages of alcohol that are higher than about 60%. So if you're trying to make a tincture of astragalus for immune support or trying to extract mushrooms for their beta-glucan content and you go up to 150 proof, you run the risk of just damaging or, or really chemically burning those sugar chains that are immune active with the higher percentages of alcohol. Sorry, could you tell me about the third? You said they didn't say astragalus, and you mentioned the third. Um, astragalus medicinal mushrooms. Was there a third, third one that needed to be in the lower alcohol content? I mean, anything that's got a lot of mucilage or slime or starch in it, marshmallow root, slippery elm bark. Um, I, I think I did actually mention. I said dandelion. I would put dandelion down here, but you could extract a dandelion up here. It wouldn't be a total loss. It's those immune active polysaccharides that you're trying to preserve. Oats, milky oat tops, for example, right, which also contain beta glucan and some immune active polysaccharides. So we're going to go with this right now because Tulsi is aromatic, doesn't have any starches in it, 
super loaded with those oily volatiles, and that's going to give us our brightest, most zingy tincture and capture all of those volatile oils. People also ask me about fresh herbs versus dry herbs when we're making tinctures. And one of the things, if you, if you have dry herbs, you can make tea. So one of the real advantages, I think, of making a tincture is that you can get this fresh plant material that you just got out of the garden and immediately put it in ethanol, stabilize it, and preserve it. And this is unique, right? There's this somewhat magical plant called wormwood, Artemisia absinthium, which is the starting material for making absinthe. And it's loaded with this volatile called thujone in its glandular trichomes. And thujone has a checkered history, right? Um, it's a little bit neurotoxic, but at tiny doses, it does interesting things to our brain. And some people are into that stuff. So if you want to make a high thujone wormwood tincture and you dry your wormwood, 50 to 75% of it is lost to the air and oxidized or converted. So if you're making wormwood tincture out of dry wormwood, you're going to get very little thujone. But if you can chop it up and put it into alcohol fresh, then you'll capture a good amount of that thujone and lock it into a very stable situation, which is great if that's what you're after. Now, yeah? So the point is, when you have fresh material, fresh plant, fresh plant material, it's got water in it. So does that change the percentage of alcohol um, in your final tincture? And the answer is yes. But it doesn't change it very much, depending on how strong your tincture is. Many herbs, particularly leafy ones, can be up to like 80% water. So if we put in, um, you know, I'll give you a, a very basic math primer on tinctures. The way we're going to do Tulsi is, um, I have three ounces of Tulsi, and I'm going to put it into 24 fluid ounces of my 150 proof alcohol. So we call this, by reducing the numbers, a one to eight tincture. And you don't really need to know this at all. It's not important. It's important if you want to make a tincture with the same strength next year, right? Basically, it's just having a recipe. Weigh out your herbs, measure out your alcohol. <coughs> Fluffy things go in like this. If I'm tincturing echinacea root, it might be one to three. Okay? I can get two pounds of echinacea root, or 32 ounces, into 96 ounces, or 96 fluid ounces, of water. And because echinacea does contain some of those polysaccharides, I put it in at about 50% alcohol. Now, if it's fresh, okay, and for sake of argument, let's... Um, say that 75% of it is water. Out of those 32 ounces of fresh echinacea root, right, three quarters of this, um, 4 per 8, 32, so 3 per 8, 24, 24 ounces of it is water. I'm sorry, I learned my multiplication tables as a kid in Italy, so I cannot multiply in English. <laughs> so 24 ounces of that is water. If we have 96 ounces of this and 75% of it is, or 50% of it is alcohol, we're talking about what? 48 alcohol and 48 water. So we'll take that 24 plus that 48. 72 ounces of water to 48 ounces of ethanol. So uh, the percentage has decreased, right? But if we did the math, we could say 48 out of this total is what the final percentage of alcohol is. And the only thing you have to worry about is that it's higher than about 25%. If it's lower than 25%, then you're going to end up with maybe a chance of microbial growth. It's very unlikely, but it's possible. So what we're going to do today is this, the 1 to 8 tincture. Why? Because Tulsi leaves are fluffy, whereas Echinacea root is super dense. So you can get this much into only three volumes of alcohol. And again, this is not important. You can just put herbs in a jar and cover them with alcohol, and you can make a really great shelf-stable preserved extract if you start with 100 proof vodka. That's all you really need to know. But if you want to get fancy and get consistent, measuring your stuff out and having a basic recipe is not a horrible idea. Does that sound OK? <clears throat> so. Um, to make our 24, I just really have a measuring jar here. And to make my life easy today, I'm just going to assume this is 
okay? Now, we know it's not, it's only 95, but I'm calling it close enough for today. If um, I had my graduated cylinders and my more sensitive measuring equipment, I would calculate exactly how much here I would need to make 75%. But out of 24 ounces, three quarters of that is 18 ounces of alcohol, and then the remaining six ounces is gonna be water. Does that sound okay for now? All right. <clears throat> so we'll just measure out the 18 ounces. and then fill it up to 24 with this. Now, if we were following good manufacturing practice, you know what, I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna take the alcohol and I'm gonna put it in this jar right now. <clears throat> We've measured out the 18. And then six ounces of water is gonna get added to that to bring us up to 24. And you might say, How do you know that 24 ounces of alcohol is going to fit into this three ounces of Tulsi in this quart size mason jar? Just because I've done it a couple times before. But really, you might have to play around a little bit. I'll tell you, 32 ounces of alcohol will not fit into a 32 ounce jar if you've got a bunch of herbs in it as well. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so the reason, can anyone tell me the reason why I poured the alcohol into this jar rather than just pouring the water right on top of it? Correct. It's in case you have human error and you overpour your water, if you're really trying to be stringent about your alcohol percentage, you'd have to throw that whole thing out. So this prevents that human error. You measure out each ingredient individually, then you go through the blending process. Does that make sense? I'll tell you a little story. I already did that. I'll tell you a little story about um, some of the early days of research and development at Urban Moonshine. We would do, um, which is an extract company that I've been working with for about 10 years. We make bitters and tonics. Um, we would steep big batches of extract in um, beer pony kegs, stainless steel pony kegs. And the reason we chose stainless steel is we didn't want to use um, plastic. And they don't make like 25 gallon glass jars that are very cheap, right? They make gallon sized ones, which is how we started. But once we wanted to scale up, we started using pony kegs. And so um, Colleen, my colleague and production manager at the time, was doing some research and development batches of astragalus root tincture. And when she came to open the top of the pony keg, right, there's that sort of thing that you can pull up and then the lid that you lift. And when she removed the metal safeties, the lid shot up into the air and this astragalus root started like bubbling out, okay? So she called me and was like, what the heck is going on here? And we looked and we looked and, you know, the 50% alcohol was, was put on that astragalus root just per my recipe and we just couldn't figure out what had happened until I was like, okay, you just got to talk me through the process step by step. What did you do to make this tincture? So she cleaned out and sanitized the keg, dried the keg, added the dry astragalus root to the keg, added water to the keg, added alcohol to the keg, sealed it up and let it sit. Anyone know the density of this stuff right here, the ethanol? What's the density of pure ethanol at room temperature? More than water or less than water? It's less dense than water. It's 0.789 grams per milliliter. Water is one gram per milliliter. So let's think about that process. We put the roots in the keg, we put the water in the keg, we put the alcohol in the keg. It's all like packed in there tight. It's gonna sit there for a month. Alcohol is lighter than water. It's hard to shake. I mean, but we do. We would roll it around on the floor, right? But it's packed in so tight that the water, having been added by itself, sat at the bottom where just a little bit of astragalus root, which is super starchy and sweet, started fermenting. And so even though there was water up above, even though there was alcohol up above, it never trickled down to the bottom, and the astragalus fermented, created all this gaseous pressure. When we opened the lid, bam! So mix your water and your alcohol first. Shake it really well so that the alcohol and water are truly blended, and then add it to the mix is the lesson that I learned from that. Also, don't make any assumptions in process control. Go through all the details. Really check it out. So now that we've blended about 24 ounces of menstruum, 
three quarters of a quart. This Tulsi in here is late season holy basil from my garden. I harvested this probably about a week and a half ago, which is really bizarre for Vermont that on like November 1st or Halloween, you can harvest an annual plant and it's still green, flowering, smells delicious. We've since gotten, you know, almost a foot of snow, so that's a little more normal. Um, but it's late season, so it's not the ideal time to harvest the Tulsi, but it's still really, really good. And um, I'm kind of packing it in, but I don't want to pack it in too much because I want to make sure the ethanol fully percolates through all of it. Um, and it's about three ounces by weight. So now the trick is just adding what's called the menstruum to the herbs. And this technique of tincture making was brought to us, at least in the European tradition, and I think they were some of the first who did this, by the alchemist and itinerant drunk doctor guy, Paracelsus. Anyone heard of this person? He lived in about the 15, late 1400s, early 1500s in Europe. Look at that. And this is really what you want. You want enough alcohol to barely cover your herbs, right? Not a huge amount of headspace. Definitely not a bunch of herbs sticking out of the top, okay? So for Tulsi, this ratio of one to eight works really well. And that generally is a good ratio for most of your greens and your leaves and your fluffy things. If you're talking about other roots, um, sometimes you can get a little more concentrated. So Paracelsus had this, yeah. Are you including stems in there? Or just I, that's a great point. So are we including stems in here or is it just leaves? It's leaves and flowers. And herbalists have this thing called garbling. Anyone heard this word before? It's the technical term for removing the active parts of your plants from the inactive parts. And that usually means removing the leaves and flowers from the stems. So we have sort of the herbal quilting hour, which is a bunch of herbalists sitting around a table with big baskets of stemmy plants, and we strip the leaves, and we strip the flowers, and then we dry them. Yeah, just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It's fun, and we chat, and we have tea. Again, what, how much alcohol and how much water is in So in this container, it's uh, 150 proof because of the volatile oil content in here. So we have 75% alcohol in here. So 24 ounces total, 18 ounces, which is 3 quarters of 24, is alcohol, and 6 ounces is water. Because the Tulsi was dry, no water from the herbs. So we don't have to worry about that. It's going to be 75% once we strain it. Does that make sense? OK. <clears throat> so I'm just going to let that sit here. Um, Paracelsus was the first, and right around then, at the be beginning of the 1500s, end of the 1400s, was when Europeans first were messing around with distilling on kind of a big scale. And these folks were alchemists, right? Or at least that's what they called themselves. It was really the beginning of chemistry, though, because Paracelsus told us that from a plant, people you know, recognized that plants had, quote unquote, virtues or abilities to help folks, but they really didn't know what it was about the plant whether it was a spirit that lived in it that came out when you drank the tea or something else. Paracelsus had lived, um, his dad was a miner and smelter of ore. So he would get ore from the earth and smelt it, heat it up, right, to turn the oxide into metal and get precious metals out. So they were really wealthy. Paracelsus turned his back on that whole thing and wandered around Central Europe helping people out and railing against the medical establishment, basically. So he had this idea that you could transmute material by applying heat and other techniques to it. And he came up with this thought that there's something in the plant, some, he didn't call it a chemical, a substance or some substances that could be extracted and concentrated. And this was the first time people ever thought about this. We had been steeping plants in wine. We had been making tea. We had been eating plants straight up for a long, long time. But this was the first time, at least in the Mediterranean basin, that anyone thought of extracting something out of the plants. And they also had just found out that if you take wine and you send it through this thing called a still, this like amazing watery stuff that burns comes out the other end. And water that burns was very magical, right? Water that you could light on fire just blew everybody's mind. Paracelsus called it the living mercury. And so he would make these beers out of medicinal plants and distill them into alcohol, and he would call that the spirit of the plant. And we still call it spirit to this day, right? The distilled essence. And then he would use that spirit to make tinctures. 
Sometimes uh, the water was collected from the leaves of this plant called ladies' mantle by his apprentices. They would go out in the morning to gather dew from ladies' mantle, like these little cup-like leaves that cup water and just collect drops and drops and drops until they had enough to make Paracelsus's tincture. And they had to do it at the right phase of the moon, at the right time of day. Anyway, crazy stuff. We don't really do that anymore today unless we want to. And the beauty of engaging with those sort of lunar cycles and personal sort of engagement with something like a lady's mantle leaf is that it really brings you into intimate contact with the medicine you're making, which is something herbalists can do and something physicians can't do. And I feel really bad for them because I have this really intimate understanding of all the material that I recommend for my clients, how it grows, what it smells like when it's alive, what it tastes like, how to process it, how to encourage it. These are my allies and my friends as opposed to drugs or uh, medicines that you would get from a pharmacy. So Paracelsus identified sort of three main things from plants that might be useful. One is the spirit. The second is essential oils. And people had been steam distilling essential oils out of plants for a little bit of time, right? You put the plant material in here, you put water underneath, you light it on fire, and the steam goes through the basket with all the plants. And on the other side, you recover this water oil mix, which you can then let settle out. The oil rises to the top, you collect the oil. And so he would add this oil into the tincture to make it even more zingy, even more strong, right? And then he'd take all the plant material that he used of that specific herb and burn it down in a blast furnace to this white ash. And of course, what do you recover from that white ash? All the mineral content of the plants. And so all that mineral content was reintroduced to the tincture as well. And these were called spagyric or alchemical extracts. They were thought to be able to catalyze incredible change in people's health and people's lives. And in fact, they did. And he wandered around and would give drops of this to everybody and really improved their health. But he was a drunk, he was a rabble rouser, and so he had to wander from town to town, getting kicked out over and over and over again. Um, his disciples carried on his legacy. And so to this day, people call Paracelsus the founder of modern chemistry, because he's one of the first in the European tradition to come up with this idea that it's not just the plant itself, but it's stuff that's in it that's doing the work. Now, chemists have taken that, I think, to a, an absurd place. And the reason we did that is that in, um, right around the beginning of the 1800s, this German guy, Sertuner, found this stuff inside the opium poppy that everyone had been using. And he's like, this stuff makes you sleepy. I'm going to call it morphine. And once he found crystalline morphine, forget about it. That was the first isolate from a plant that we had ever used. And once we discovered that we could do that, people started extracting alkaloids from all the plants that they could find. And it really kicked off this era of drug discovery. But it's taken a little bit too far, right? Because a lot of plants have one single constituent pulled out of them to the detriment of all the others. And as herbalists, we recognize that there's this strange synergy that happens when you take a, all of the plant's constituents into your body, right? And we see this, for example, in what happened with morphine. Opium, yes, it's addictive. But one of the things that happens when you start taking a lot of opium is it puts you to sleep and you have a hard time taking more. It's also super bitter and intense to take orally, and it's difficult to overdose on it if you smoke. Not so with morphine, right? And so people started injecting morphine instead of taking it orally, and it was used for all manner of mental health issues in ways that I don't think are super appropriate, until like by the end of the 18th century, we, we had many, many morphine addicts. Fortunately, the pharmaceutical companies quickly discovered an antidote to morphine addiction, which they made by modifying the morphine alkaloid and then turning it into this stuff called heroin. And that stuff works great to get people off morphine. <laughs> anyway, long story short, Paracelsus didn't just say remove material. He also said put it back together. So after he extracted the essential oil, after he made the tincture, after he extracted the mineral salts, he put that all back together into the extract so that all parts of the plant were equally represented. His motto was solve et coagula, dissolve and then recombine. The chemists of the 19th and 20th century stuck with the dissolve part, but they never did the recombine part. And I think we've lost some of the plant chemistry as a result to our detriment. So we're not going to do that. We're just straight up steeping the holy basil in alcohol. We're going to let it sit. And then 
a little before lunchtime, we're all going to get a chance to sample a little bit of it. Okay? Yeah? Oh, the mic is not on. Um, so I'm happy to turn it on if that helps a little bit. Does that help? Okay. Sorry about that. Is your recording mic on? My recording mic, I believe, is on. That's a whole different setup. The question was, is it dry or fresh Tulsi? It was dry Tulsi. Okay. And you if it was fresh, how would you change that? If it were fresh, I would consider increasing the alcohol just a little bit to account for the water weight. And you can do the chemical calculations for that. Tulsi is like 85 to 90% water when it's fresh. Um, the problem is that, particularly with these aromatic plants, you have a hard time packing three ounces of fresh Tulsi into a jar because it's full of water. So drying your aromatic plants first can actually allow you to put more essential oil or volatile oil material into your tincture because it allows you to pack them in a little bit more. But if you dry them, dry them like for a couple of days and then immediately tincture them. Don't let them sit around for six months before extracting them, if you, if you can, if you have the luxury of doing that. The question is, what method do you use for drying? And there's so many different methods. I am a fan of the fast dry because in Vermont, if you don't dry things fast, they can mold. So 85 to 90 Fahrenheit, probably higher than that, you might start to see some loss of volatile oils on drying, and good air circulation, and ideally no UV, no sunlight. Now that said, if sunlight lets you dry things in half a day, people do hoop houses that have screens on them that they dry their herbs in, and the sun gets it up to like 90 degrees, and there's good air circulation through the open gables of, this, of these low hoop houses, right? And um, you dry your material like that, and you only get a tiny bit of UV damage. But if you have the luxury of some drying screens, which you can make with muslin and one by threes, right, and put them on a shelf, you can lay your herbs there, have a fan underneath, have a dehumidifier if necessary, right? and um, Usually in a couple of days, you'll have dry if it's 85 to 90. If you really have the wherewithal, you can build a plywood box that has runners on it that you slide those one by threes with muslin in. You put a dehumidifier inside the plywood box, and then you close the doors of the plywood box and run that dehumidifier. It warms up the air, and it sucks all the moisture out, and it's a fantastic way to dry things within 24 hours, um, even in an environment that's relatively cold and dark. Great question. Are you, are you opposed to commercial dehydrators that we use for other things? The question is, am I opposed to commercial dehydrators for drying herbs? Absolutely not. That's great. They tend to be tiny, <laughs> right? This is my only complaint, right? Um, the food dehydrators. So I'm talking about, you know, we're getting like three pounds of Tulsi from our row. <sighs> You're going to have a hard time drying that with a, with a commercial dehydrator, unless you have a really big one, in which case, great. Great. Yeah, I mean, just find the method that works for you um, for the size and scale of your herbal harvest. Um, but building a plywood box with some screens and a dehumidifier is what I've used, and it's cheap, and it works great. And it won't make jerky for you, though. OK. So yeah, one more comment here. Am I concerned about the formaldehyde that might be in plywood? I am now. <laughs> um, generally speaking, um, because they use all this like glue and stuff, I could totally see what you're talking about. Um, the plywood that I've had has been, or that I built my dehydrator out of, been sitting around for a really long time. Um, so I feel like it's probably done its off-gassing, but I'll keep that in mind in the future. I think that's a really good point. Well, what you're doing is you're extracting them. So the ethanol penetrates through the cell wall of the plant much more effectively even than water does. Um, so you're getting a broader spectrum and more complete spectrum of herbal constituents from a tincture than you are from a tea. But it's a really good point, right? If you want to give someone chamomile for their belly or to help a child gently go to sleep, you could certainly tincture chamomile flowers, but you're basically making alcoholic tea, 
right? So if you dry your chamomile and give a cup of tea, you're going to give a greater volume of herbal constituents without any alcohol and the benefit of the warm tea. So tinctures are useful because they're super portable. They're more complete extraction than, than water is, and they're super stable. That's what I really like is they stabilize the fresh plant chemistry for five, ten, some people say even more years than that. Um, but that's one of the biggest advantages. But honestly, if you have an herb like chamomile that's usually given in tea, tincturing it, it's fine if you want to stabilize it, but you could just dry your chamomile. They'll be good all winter long and make cups of tea from it. You get more of that chemistry into your body that way. Um, so in terms of the uh, rest of the conversation this morning, we talked about this a little. I want to talk a little bit about herbal medicine in general and why it's different from what we normally think of as drug-based medicine. Um, I want to introduce you to some of my favorite plants in those three basic categories we talked about, the bitters, the aromatics, and the tonics. Talk a little bit about quality. And then we already started this, extraction and preserving the harvest. So um, introduce you to the tincture, introduce you to the infused oil and salve as well. Um, I want to just take a moment before I get into the material to just say, um, acknowledge where we are in the world and in our geography. This is an old map of Southbridge. And I like it because it kind of strips away a lot of the human stuff that you see in aerial photos of today um, and gives you the bones of the land and the river that we are right next to here. We're right about up here at that bend in the river right now. And uh, beautiful frosty morning this morning um, when I got up and seeing it on the cars, seeing it on the grass. Anyway, um, I always love those first frosts of winter or late fall, um, the crystal, and seeing that phase transition, seeing the air get drier and more crisp, and of course with the moon setting in the west, beautiful morning. So I'm grateful for the place where we are, and I'm grateful for you all for being awake at this time of morning and coming to the Soil and Nutrition Conference. So just a moment of acknowledgement of gratitude for the land and gratitude for you all who are walking this path and for being here today. And I love herbal medicine, and I love growing medicinal plants because I am a wicked, lazy gardener. And I don't have to do much to nourish those plants and keep them going. In fact, if I do too much, there's some evidence that over-nitrogenizing your medicinal plants, over-fertilizing and over-watering them might decrease the amount of active chemistry that they produce. They're just having too cushy of a life. They're not challenged. And so they're not producing some of the chemistry that they use to deal with challenge in the natural world. But there's a range of really awesome plants here. Lots of bee balm and wild echinacea and goldenrod. There's some elecampane in the back. There's some black-eyed Susans, some daisy fleabane. All of these plants have medicinal activity. Um, and are useful in one way or another. And that's what I think is really neat about herbal medicine, is that we're able to find in a sort of disorganized field or meadow or out in the middle of the woods, this material that is loaded with really useful chemistry that speaks to our bodies, to our spirits, and can help keep us well in the crazy techno world in which we live, right? Nothing against that, but I really think we need some of this too in order to be able to navigate that world with grace. The other thing about herbal medicine is that it's definitely hands-on. It's about getting involved with the plants, getting involved with your medicine. So it immediately adds this layer of responsibility and connection to your medicine that I feel like modern drug-like medicine lacks. And if folks like you all get into it, who are growers and gardeners, then it's even more powerful. Because like the apprentices that Paracelsus was working with, going out into the field and getting that dew off the ladies' mantle every morning, that business changes you. Walking out barefoot into a field in the cold of the morning and like kneeling and gathering dew from these cup-like leaves, it might seem weird, but it sets you up for having experiences in the natural world that connect you to the rhythms of life and connect you to your own self. Some of the most profound experiences I've had or, or sort of answers to questions like, how am I going to help this person who came into my clinical office, have happened when I'm out in the garden and my brain is taken offline. And I'm just sitting there and being with the plants, being with the soil, being with the birds. Has anyone ever had an experience like that? Can any of you all identify with what I'm talking about? My bet is that part of the reason we're here and we're passionate about growing and about regenerative agriculture and soil is because we think that that's important and we have experienced that. 
So that's really different from the training and the applications of conventional modern tech medicine, right? That training tends to put people away from the natural world. It tends to standardize and clean rather than dirtify and lead to variability and variation the way herbal medicine does. And it creates layers of separation between the physician, their medicine, and the patient who's receiving that medicine. And I'm not saying that that's not appropriate in certain situations. I'm saying that we need this too. Okay? And we're starting to see more and more that folks are bringing herbal medicine into conventional medicine settings. For example, in the Cleveland Clinic, one of the major referral hospitals in the country, they now have a traditional Chinese medicine department where soups and broths featuring medicinal herbs are given to cancer patients alongside conventional medication. And where you can get an herbalist consult for almost anything that brings you to the Cleveland Clinic, which I think is pretty amazing, right? And I'm I may be overly optimistic, but I think that's happening more and more across the country. We're seeing it even in the University of Vermont Medical Center um, up where I live in Burlington. Now, if I show you this picture, probably everyone knows what this is. When I take this picture to herb conferences, a lot of the herbalists don't know what this is because the herb gardens look like this, right? Not a lot of monoculture. Not a lot of sensitive plants like potatoes or tomatoes. So what is this little sucker right here? Colorado potato beetle. Not a friend. Um, I started working in Vermont in 96 um, on an organic farm called the LePage Farm with this great farmer, Alan LePage, who's so brilliant, taught me so much about um, gardening and cultivation and really launched me into growing medicinal plants. Um, He's not a fan of these. We would go out and squish these suckers, right? And he had this whole thing where after squishing them, he would make us put them into a jar with a spray top and spray potato beetle juice onto the plants to, I think, deter more. Yeah. Other folks have done this too? Wow. OK. Um, it's, like, it's like homeopathic pesticides almost. But, if you find potato beetles in your garden, what is, other than like grinding them up and spraying them on the plants, what's your like long-term solution for this? Bolster the health of the plants until they can resist them too. Bolster the health of the plants until they can resist the potato beetles. And how do we do that? Nurturing your soil biology. Nurturing your soil biology, supporting the plants themselves, making sure that the plants that you're growing are appropriate varietals for your growing environment, right? Um, when and if you can, or plants that have a little bit of experience with the type of environment in which you live. Any other ideas? Diversify your garden so there isn't a monoculture. Maybe talk about some sink plants, like that can collect aphids or potato beetles so that they go there instead of on their crops. Was there another comment? Encouraging birds to come into your garden um, by putting stakes between the tomato plants um, so that birds can come and do that work of picking off the potato beetles. Basically like creating an ecological support structure, whether it's from the soil or from beneficial allies like birds or from diversity, right? You all are recreating natural environments. I didn't hear anyone say, spray with pesticide. What's up with y'all? I guess I'm at the wrong conference, yeah. <laughs> Potato beetles have a lot of pesticide resistance too, which makes sense, right? Because what does nature do when you apply a concentrated chemical on it? It adapts. It adapts. And this is the exact same story that you see if someone were to present in the hospital with an infection. Let's say someone has an abscess, right? I, I learned sort of a lot of my clinical herbal training at this gathering of hippies called the Rainbow Gatherings. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of these, but it's this traveling group of folks who go all around the country and live in the woods. I now have real qualms about the way the forests are treated um, at Rainbow Gatherings, and I don't know if that's really being addressed or not, but it was very sad to see what the National Forest had to endure when 20,000 people came into the National Forest for two weeks. Anyway. But I ran um, first aid tents there and learned a lot about herbal medicine in that context. And what I saw is that people out in the woods don't take care of their feet. And they get things in their feet and they ignore them. And then they show up at my first aid 
tent with these big fat abscesses on their feet where there's an active infection. Now, if you present there, right, with that going on, the solution for that is an antibiotic, right? But that's like saying, let's put a pesticide on here. And I know that in an acute situation where you have a, an abscess that's maybe causing blood poisoning and streaking up the limb, you need something aggressive like an antibiotic. But imagine now a different situation where we have a child presenting to the pediatrician with recurrent ear infections, okay? Now the American Academy of Pediatrics would come around to say, hey, giving this kid antibiotics all the time is probably not the best idea for a range of different reasons, including antibiotic resistance by the bacteria, just like pesticide resistance by the beetle, and destruction of the gut flora of that child and immunologic disturbance in the long term for that child. Better than to just send them home and let them wait it out, ear infection-wise. I, as an herbalist, say, no. How about, especially if they're recurrent, bolstering the health of that child's soil, or the equivalent thereof, bolstering the health of that child's immune system, trying to make it so that they have simple but not antibiotic-based techniques like a mullen ear oil that they can put one or two drops of in their ear that helps retard viral or bacterial infections in their ear and also soothes pain. Right. So there's all these alternatives that herbal medicine provides that are very similar to the strategies you all talked about when dealing with the ecological system of a garden. So we talk about human beings as being ecological systems too, and we use the same principles of regenerative agriculture in terms of regenerating health in humans. And that's what I really think makes herbal medicine different and why I think herbal medicine is a great match for the work that we do in our gardens and in our soils and on our farms. And it blows my mind, and has always blown my mind, to talk to organic gardeners and growers in Vermont who use conventional tech medicine only for their children's health. I'm like, is there a disconnect here? And then there's folks in Vermont who um, use organic and regenerative agriculture techniques, but then go to the co-op and buy pills of herbs in plastic jars, <laughs> even though they've got these amazing gardens. There's a disconnect there, too. It's um, this thing that we call like domain blindness, right? We're like stuck in what we know and we don't see that the principles in one domain can also apply in other domains. So that's what I'm trying to talk about here. You all know what herbal medicine is. You know exactly what it is. It's the same thing that regenerative agriculture is, just applied to the human system rather than to the garden or to the farm. And instead of talking about mineral content and microbial balance of soil, we're talking about mineral and phytonutrient content in humans and microbial balance in humans. And herbal medicine knows a lot of techniques about how to help that happen. So our roots are global. There is no indigenous culture that does not use medicinal plants for health and wellness as their primary system of medicine. Even right now, the WHO says that for 75% of the humans on this planet, herbal medicine is the only medicine because they don't have access to modern tech medicine the way we do. So herbal medicine isn't just historical. It isn't just something we need to revive. It's something that's very alive and well on the world today. And in fact, it's keeping people healthy who have low access or poor access to conventional healthcare resources the way we do here in our very privileged Western culture. Does that make sense? So just some examples. Traditional Chinese medicine might be one of the oldest. Its roots go back to probably 4,000 BC in the delta and river valley of the Yellow River, where supposedly the Yellow Emperor was gazing at tortoise shells, developing the I Ching, the fortune-telling system, and talking to his advisor, Kibo, about the power of medicinal plants, about qi and vital force, and all of the things that traditional Chinese medicine brings to our understanding today. A range of amazing plants, including astragalus and the medicinal mushrooms, dan shen, codenopsis, et cetera, that come to my herbal clinic from the roots of traditional Chinese medicine. Almost as old, and some might say older, is the Ayurvedic tradition from the Indian subcontinent. The Vedas were written, again, 3,500 years, maybe 4,000 years before the Common Era. Like we're talking five to 6,000 years ago. And there are these incredible poems about the breath of fire going over this black sea and black sky, creating the world, and talking about how Soma, this incredible drug that reconnects us to spirit, which some people say is the fly agaric mushroom, some people say is the ephedra plant, was used in these rituals of reconnection to nature. 
the Ayurvedic tradition, which literally means the science or knowledge of life, talked about constitutions of people and herbs that could be used to impact those constitutions. Herbs like turmeric or tulsi come to us from the Ayurvedic tradition um, and its incredible richness. We have umami medicine and the Persian Arabic tradition. These folks are brilliant. In fact, some of the best medicine during the Dark Ages of Europe, 1100, 1200, came from Persia. Not only did they invent algebra, number zero, and important concepts in mathematics, but they invented pulse diagnosis. They invented a lot of the alchemy principles that we use and still underpin chemistry and distillation and extraction today. Paracelsus owes a great debt to Persian and Arabic medicine. This physician, Ibn Sina, which is transliterated into Latin as Avicenna, encoded a lot of this wisdom in his book called The Canon of Medicine, which talks about diagnosis, medicine, and is the first known recorded description of the clinical trial. Ibn Sina had this great idea, which was like, well, if we think something might work, why don't we test it and compare it to something we know doesn't work and see if there's different outcomes? What a thought. No one had done that before. The rational basis for applying therapeutic substances was going back and reading Aristotle and Plato and making sure that everything lined up with its correspondences. That was it. A great amount of rational thinking got injected into our system of medicine through the Persian and Arabic systems in the 1200s in Europe. We've got an incredible and diverse, rich tradition from the African <coughs> continent. And African continent is somewhat misleading. There's so many different bioregions and ecosystems in Africa. It's, it's just, it doesn't do the continent service to treat it as a single monolithic entity. So we talk about the part of Africa that's above the Sahara really being more similar in its medical tradition to Italy and Greece and the Mediterranean basin, right? Tunisia, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco. And then we talk about sub-Saharan Africa. And we divide that into East African traditions, like the ones found in um, Tanzania, for example, and West African traditions in Ghana and the Congo and the rainforest. Very different plants. And then by the time we get a little bit further south, um, in South Africa, we switch back to a Mediterranean-style climate almost, and the plants totally change too. Each one of these regions has a rich and varied tradition, some of which was brought to this continent via the African diaspora through the Caribbean, for example. Then, of course, we have a traditional European and Mediterranean basin. Um, I'm not even going to talk about that. Um, then we have our indigenous North, Central, and South American herbal medicine systems, which also are incredibly rich and bring us things like cacao, chocolate, an amazing medicinal plant that comes from this amazing magical place in the jungles of Central and South America. In the what we call Oceania, or Australia and New Zealand, we also have an incredible um, rooted traditional medicine system that is just really barely beginning to be uncovered, discovered, and brought into the world. And finally, in this country, we have a couple of interesting new techniques of herbal medicine that blossomed in the 1800s, when really it was kind of the Wild West, right? This is the snake oil salesman time, and really there were a lot of snake oil salesmen. But there also were some really brilliant herbalists and physicians who used medicinal plants. The eclectic physicians borrowed, or some might say appropriated, a lot of the indigenous North American medicinal plants, like echinacea, for example, and brought them into their practice with really good effect, but with very little acknowledgment of the traditions that had brought those plants into their practice from which they benefited. Now we know that echinacea, golden seal, American ginseng, these treasures of indigenous First Nation folks in this continent really are incredible blessings for us, but we really have to acknowledge that um, whenever we use those plants, we owe a great debt of gratitude to the folks who pioneered their use and figured out how to use them safely. Then the physiomedicalists, this was a really interesting system. Has anyone heard of Samuel Thompson? Um, people call him the Pucum and Purgum herbalist, and that's literally what he did. If you went to Sam Thompson's clinic, the first thing he would do is give you a ton of lobelia, which is an herb that is a strong emetic, and make you vomit. Then he would give you laxatives, right? And after that was all done, he'd feed you a ton of cayenne. And the idea was, get it out and then feed the fire. And this was a very rugged and intense system of herbal medicine, but it suited frontier folk in the 1800s really well, right? And what it was was not what the regular physicians were doing. What were the regular physicians doing? 
mercury, opium and morphine, and a range of other questionable therapies that in many cases actually left people sicker than when they first came to see the doctor. I will tell you, especially in a situation where people are eating whole plants and whole foods, 1800s US, letting the body just do its thing is the first and best strategy if you have a problem. Seriously, in many, many cases, diseases are self-limiting or they take care of themselves. If a kid has a fever, I know that the urge to intervene is very strong, but many times the intervention does more harm than good, even today. Though back then, it definitely did. Kid had a fever, they'd go into the doctor, they'd get a little mercury to deal with the infection, and they'd get some opium to make sure they didn't cough too much. <laughs> oh boy. So anyway, even if you went to Sam Thompson, just the simple fact that he wasn't giving you mercury and opium was a leg up in terms of your health and well-being. But there might actually have been some therapeutic support to encouraging flow with things like laxatives and purgatives, and warming up the circulation, making blood move around, okay? Um, so that really takes me to some of the unifying principles of herbal medicine. We're about good flow, for sure. Our physiologic processes need to be moving efficiently and effectively with good flow. And that's what Thompson was trying to do by making the blood move around more by giving people a bunch of cayenne, another plant that comes to us from Central and South American indigenous herbalism. But we really need to make sure that we've got good inputs as well, right? What do we talk about when we're making uh, herbal tincture? Your herbal tincture is only as good as your starting material. Similarly, your health is only as good as your starting material. People say you are what you eat. Herbalists take that a little further and say you are what you assimilate. But still, if you don't put good material in there, even if your assimilative power is great, you're going to have a real hard time having really good health if you don't have good starting material. And I like to reduce that to five key components. Good air, good water, good love, good movement, and good nutrition. If a human has access to those things, then generally speaking, the body has the tools it needs to maintain its own health. And we as herbalists trust the living system, and rather than trying to control it, we step back and we support it. Same way as with a potato beetle infestation, right? If it's happening, rather than it being something we need to fight against, we really take it as wisdom of the ecosystem showing us that something is up with the health of those plants, and we want to support the health of the system rather than trying to control the infestation with a poison. Finally, we need to make sure that there's good output, and herbalism really emphasizes this, okay? We talk about poop endlessly. We really make sure urination is adequate. We also make sure that people perspire. I ask this in clinic all the time. If you go for a strong you know, hike up a hill when it's like a 60, 70 degree day, do you perspire a little bit? And some people tell me no. And if this is the case, I really try and make sure that their circulation is adequate to encourage good perspiration, that their pores are open, right? The whole idea is if you dam up a stream, or if you put rocks or blocks in the middle of the stream, eddies and pockets of stagnation begin to form. And those eddies and pockets of stagnation are potentially areas where imbalance can start to develop. You know, just ask someone who's constipated whether good flow or movement is useful or not. Constipation makes everything feel worse. And in many cases can underlie certain pathologies. So we just try to make sure everything keeps flowing and keeps moving. That includes the blood internally, lymph internally, and it also includes all of our output system, liver, kidneys, lung, and skin. Okay, does that make sense? So when talking about medicinal plants, um, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on good inputs, because this is like healthy human stuff. We will talk about plants that help with good flow and physiologic processes internally, and plants that encourage good output, right? The aromatics do amazing things here. The bitters as well, but the bitters also do a lot here, helping to encourage elimination and good flow, okay? And our tonics, finally, are fine-tuning agents that the physiology uses to maintain health in its basic physiologic processes. <clears throat> So the last thing I want to say before I get into some of my favorite plants is that herbal medicine has the ability to reconnect us to a living, breathing ecology. We, whether we like it or not, are embedded in a world that surrounds us. And the types of foods and substances that we take in internally have the ability to either connect us with that world 
that is around us or not connect us with that world that is around us. For example, when eating meat from a concentrated area of feedlot, we are really not in any way, shape, or form connected with the processes in the soil, in the grass, in the air, and in the water of our local environment. These animals are, in fact, completely disconnected. The food they eat doesn't come from their local environment. It comes from a centralized grain manufacturing facility that is completely non-diverse, right? They also don't get to move around or experience their environment at all and definitely don't get to behave the way cows or pigs or chickens usually get to behave. Whereas when we engage with or consume meat from a grass-fed local farm, we are eating meat from an animal that is completely engaged and connected to its local environment in a very, very different way. Does that make sense? So similarly, we as animals have the choice of existing in concentrated area feedlots where we go from our living cubicle to our transportation cubicle to our eating cubicle where the food coming from many, many different places right, is recombined in these interesting ways after its major protein, fats, and carbs are extracted. And then we put that into our stomach and return to our transportation cubicle and return to our living cubicle. And that's it. No wonder we make weird choices. So. Even in that situation, and I'm not here to argue that we should put humans out into the country everywhere across the countryside in the world. I honestly don't know if that's a good idea. I am a big believer in cities and urban environments and concentrating humanity into those cities rather than spreading them across everywhere. I just think our cities could be way better than they are in terms of incorporating plants, living machines, and green technologies to make them more sustainable and more carbon neutral. We have the know-how. I think we lack the collective will. But that's an entirely different conversation. My point is not that people should leave cities. My point is that herbal medicine gives us the ability to bring wild plants and all of their chemistry into these city environments and support people, right, even if they're stuck in these living cubicles. Now, that said, getting a human out into the world into this is also really important, at least once in a while. And it seems to be really good for us as well. But if all you do is you have a window box with some lemon balm, and you get your fingers into that dirt and you smell it once in a while, that's amazing. And that's really good medicine. And there's evidence that even that helps with health and disease in human beings. Any questions or comments on some of this stuff about herbal medicine or, or what it is and what makes it different? Feel, yeah. Go ahead. So this is a somewhat fanciful artistic rendition of um, flow and vibration in nature as seen in a conifer forest. It could also be interpreted as what's called the wood wide web, the network of mycelial interactions that connect all of the botanical parts of a forest and spread things like nutrients and glucose and information between all of those components. But ultimately what I'm trying to say is that there's connections that largely are chemical that unite all of the pieces of an ecology and we need to be part of that. We need to stand right here. Even if not actually in a forest, we can do this in the city as long as the chemistry that comes from places like this, embodied in these medicinal plants and mushrooms, streams through us as well in our city room. Other, yep. Can you just say it about the cities that we have the technology that we use, like trees, uh, living trees, and so on, for improving urban environments? We have the technology. What we lack is the collective will. Where is that going to come from? So the question is um, if we have technology like living machines, and if we understand the importance of community gardens in urban environments, um, if we know how to recycle our water into gray water disposal and living systems that can produce food for us, why are we not applying it? Is it because we lack the collective will? Where is that collective will going to come from? That is a long question, but I'll offer this as an initial answer. My, my faith-based hope, and I, I admit that it's based on faith, is that if we can get more people to consume medicinal plants in decent quantities, their thinking and their spirit will shift. And part of the reason we don't pay attention to the wastefulness of cities and the environmental detriment that cities often cause with their waste streams is because we are not engaged with this. 
and even though medicinal plants help with health and disease in very specific ways that I'll talk about in a little bit, I think the biggest gift they give is helping us to wake up to the fact that the natural world is helpful to us. And when people start to have those shifts occur, my feeling is that their personality and the way they look at the world changes and shifts. And I, I told this story yesterday, but I'll tell it again today, of a client I worked with who had digestive problems who came into my clinic and for whom I recommended a simple tincture of dandelion, which is a very gentle bitter, to help with his digestive problems. He came um, back a couple weeks later and said, well, you know, my digestive problems are a lot better. I'm not having the heartburn I used to have, but I got a question about the dandelion you gave me. Is that the same stuff that's in my lawn? And I was like, yes, it's the same plant that's in your lawn. And he said, you mean the stuff I spray Roundup on? <laughs> and, and then just work that out. Work out the thought process that that person is having, right? And so little by little, if we can turn people on to medicinal plants and they can recognize that they provide benefit, and not only to us, but also they can increase the biodiversity of our gardens and improve the health of our soil and improve the resilience of our farms, then things are going to start clicking and the principles that underlie herbal medicine will also start to click into the collective consciousness, which is diversity helps, support rather than controlling, trust the living system, and learn from the living system. And biomimicry in design and biomimicry in technology is something we're barely starting to scratch the surface of, but has great promise in terms of getting us to where we need to be in terms of becoming a more sustainable culture. So I don't think the collective will can be imposed from the top down. I think it literally needs to come from the grass roots or the herb roots, if you want to call them. And I think we're on the front lines of that. Um, but you know what happens when you start to get into organic growing, regenerative growing, herbal medicine. The way you look at the world changes. And if we can show a better way, then my feeling is that the collective will will follow be just because it's easier. It's easier, it's cheaper, it's more sustainable, there's less cataclysmic events, the system is more stable and resilient. Not just for the individual, but for the family, for the community, for the city, and hopefully eventually the culture. So that's a long run around to collective will, but um, hopefully some of my optimism has rubbed off a little bit. Yeah, comment. So the comment here is, is quoting Susan Weed, an herbalist, um, who says that bitters mature us or make us grow up and that the sweet, salty, processed diet is sort of a childish diet, right? And we have mob mentality, right? Who, if, you, if you have free access to the cookie jar, what kid would not say, all right, no, I, I, I want that radicchio instead, <laughs> right? But it really does behoove us to think and be mindful and recognize that the bitter flavor is really important for health and disease, but it also is really important for ecology. I appreciate what Susan says, and thank you for quoting that. Rosemary Gladstar, who's an herbalist who lives in Vermont, a friend of mine, and a pretty amazing all-around human being, um, she says, like, the sweetness of life is great, but it's what's bitter in life that makes us who we are, right? And she doesn't turn her back on challenges or bitterness, and neither should we. Now, granted, some challenges are too much, and I'm not going to ask you to take you know, ounces and ounces of gentian root tincture until you vomit. That doesn't make any sense. But in small amounts, bitterness is really, really useful. It catalyzes change. It gives us challenge. So I want to start by talking about some of my favorite bitters. And this is a picture from the Alps of gentiana lutea, or gentian. And gentian root is the most bitter plant that we know of, the secoiridoid lactone amarogentin that it contains can be detected at part per million level by our tongue, some of the most bitter substance around. So gentian root, um, one of the reasons we really like it as a base for digestive bitters is that it's clean bitter. It doesn't have any astringency or any tannins, it's just pure bitter flavor. And if you've never gotten a chance to taste gentian root, I really recommend it. Gentian is recommended um, for a range of different conditions, and I'll just mention that it's used both for overeating and for anorexia, specifically recommended in both of those cases. So what the heck? 
I want to talk about that for just a second because it really brings home what bitters do in the human physiology. When you taste something bitter right before mealtime, your mouth kind of goes and you start to salivate. That increase in saliva is transmitted to the rest of the body, um, particularly the pancreas and the liver, where you also see production of digestive enzymes and production of bile. So all the digestive juices start to crank up when you taste something bitter. And your appetite begins to stimulate, and your stomach begins to rumble, right? So for anorexia, that makes great sense. If someone has sort of shut down their hunger response through an eating disorder, having that bitter stimulate and reawaken and re-engage the digestive system is considered a specific therapeutic application for this particular plant. So we use it in the context of eating disorders where food restriction is the main hallmark. And prolonged food restriction leads to dysfunction in appetite. We also use it as an appetite stimulant when people are feeling low appetite in the context, for example, of cancer chemotherapy. We use a little bit of gentian root to stimulate the appetite. But wouldn't you know that if you take gentian about five, 10 minutes before eating, and now we have clinical research showing this, you consume 20 to 30% less food. So that's what I'm talking about. Ending overeating, but also stimulating appetite can happen at the same time with something like gentian root or digestive bitters. So how the heck does this work? It happens through this thing called the bitter taste receptor that is sensitive to these bitter tasting compounds in medicinal plants. And when the bitter taste receptor is stimulated, it increases the production of digestive juices, but it also begins to regulate the musculature that lines our entire GI tract. This is partly why bitters help with heartburn. It astringes the valve at the bottom of the throat, closing that valve down, which helps with reflux and heartburn. And it also closes the valve at the pylorus, or the end of the stomach, which means your food stays in your stomach. It also, the bitter taste receptor, triggers the release of what are called satiety hormones, or substances that are released into the bloodstream that make us feel full and satisfied. Things like polypeptide Y or glucagon-like peptide 1. When these reach the brain, the brain is like, ooh, boy, that was good. I'm feeling full. I don't really need anything else. The slowing down of the movement of food so it stays in the stomach longer and the presence of these hormones that make us feel full are thought to be the reason why when you taste something bitter before you eat, you consume 20 to 30% less food. But that's exactly what happened when you put people in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet. The people who got the bitters, 20 to 30% less. The other folks, normal American-sized meal. So my contention is not that we choose to overeat and become obese in this culture, or that it really is the fault of the sugar that is present everywhere. I think it's because we lack bitterness everywhere. Because, like you said, we're going around fairly childish in at least our dietary choices. Not sophisticated, not grown up. If you add bitters, not only do you consume your food more effectively, but you eat less in the end. And one of my favorite applications of a bitter like gentian is when I'm feeling like it's been five or six hours since I ate and I'm not in a very good mood and I'm making poor food choices as a result. Because what's the pattern that I see in clinic all the time? It's called the sugar roller coaster, right? Feeling hypoglycemic, getting some refined carbohydrates, feeling better and somewhat crazy, then 45 minutes, two hours later, crashing again, repeating the cycle, right? And those refined carbohydrates enter our system really quickly in the absence of any bitter taste and to slow them down. And as a result, we get this hypoglycemic roller coaster. So what bitters can do is help interrupt that and trick our brain into thinking that we've eaten because all those digestive secretions are starting up without actually eating. And as a result, the hangry feeling goes away, and you can pick some nuts and avocados instead of some chips and cookies, okay? as, as I have witnessed many times personally in my own body. But gentian root is difficult to take because it's very strong. And if you mix it into a digestive bitter, you have to do it as a tincture. I would never in a million years recommend a gentian root tea. It's too bitter, OK? So um, one of the easier ways to start people on the bitter um, habit is with modified form of chicory. This is called radicchio. And radicchio is actually chicory. Do you all know that plant? Chicory grows by the side of the road. And the First Nations legend is that those beautiful blue flowers it has are actually pieces of the sky that were torn out of the sky by a raven. And if you look at the end of the petals, you find that they have this sort of like 
torn or ragged edge to them? Well, it's because the raven tore that piece right out of the sky. And so when this chicory blooms on the side of the road, it blooms about the same time as Queen Anne's lace. And I feel like when I'm walking down the trail or driving down the highway, I'm like driving in the sky with these white clouds here and there and the, the blue of the chicory flowers. But chicory leaves in its straight up native form, the way we find it by the side of the road today, is still used in Greece to make this dish called horta. Has anyone heard of this stuff? Yeah. Horta is grated fresh garlic, olive oil, and mushed up chicory leaves. It is bitter, it is pungent, it's peppery with that fresh raw olive oil, and they just eat it as an appetizer. Wow, it's intense, but as your palate matures, as your flavor preferences grow up, you actually start to really enjoy it. And the reason you start to enjoy it is because you feel alive when you taste something bitter, not only in your mind and spirit, but also in your GI tract. Everything wakes up, everything starts to juice up. It's pretty um, incredible and something that I personally now am kind of almost addicted to. Um, addicted is probably the wrong word. Yeah. The question is, where does arugula fall into this whole bitter thing? And arugula is also called rocket. It's a type of mustard, really. So it's a relative of the broccoli family. I call it pungent more than bitter. But it has a slight bitterness to it. But you know, one of the key characteristics of the bitter flavor is that it lingers. And you know if you eat radicchio or you eat endive or escarole or even frisée lettuce to a certain extent, you get flavor, you get bitterness, some of the same stuff you get with arugula. But then there's this persistent bitterness that stays on your tongue, sometimes for even a couple of minutes. And arugula lacks that. So it's not my favorite bitter. I think of it more as a pungent. But it's great to help with like gas and bloating because it's pungent and aromatic. Um, so this is one of the easiest ways to get into the bitter habit. Radicchio is a modified form of chicory that doesn't taste as intensely bitter. It's a lot juicier and crunchier and pleasant. You can chop that up and just make a straight salad with it with olive oil and salt. And if you want a little bit of grated garlic, that's fine with me. And you can use that as an appetizer. Or you can start to introduce it into your other greens. Someone likes iceberg lettuce? Great. I'd love to inject just a little bit of color into your iceberg lettuce. You know how we talk about eating the rainbow. So let's put some radicchio leaves chopped up into your iceberg. And people start to say, like, it was good, but it was maybe a little bitter. I'm like, that's great. Was it OK? It's like, yeah, it's OK. I can live with it. All right, put a little more in next week. Let's get a little more accustomed to it. And then you slowly cut you know, the iceberg with radicchio over time, and people begin to really develop an appreciation for it. The other way to do it is um, you, know, you can take this and you can um, actually take the whole leaves and use them as little bowls for things, like you could put some um, cooked quinoa or some risotto inside it or some mushrooms inside it with olive oil. And then you just like serve it as little bowls with all of your tasty stuff in it. And then you expect the people to actually eat the bowl, too. Right? That's another way to inject it in there. Yeah? Yeah, it's too, it's too intense, raw. I think it's really intense raw. Um, and for many people have different levels of sensitivities in their gut. Some people yesterday were telling me they love raw garlic. It's too much for me. Um, so I'm with you. But um, if you grate it and put it in olive oil and let it sit, right, a little bit of oxidation of those pungent compounds takes place over the course of 10, 15 minutes. And that makes it a little softer, a little easier to deal with. You know how when you make fresh gazpacho and you taste it right away, or fresh salsa even, you're like, dang! That's garlicky. But then you let it sit overnight, and you taste it again, and it's like mellowed a lot. So anyway, I want to talk more specifically about garlic when we get into the aromatics, because it is a really useful medicinal plant. Weird. Um, so the question is, how do we communicate the benefits of medicinal plants to others? Because we're all kind of together or somewhat, somewhat aligned here in this room. What we need to do is we need to change the world. So how do we effectively communicate some of these ideas or the benefit of a plant like gentian to the folks with whom we interact? Do we use the clinical research basis to convince them with science? Or how do we bolster the case for herbal medicine? when many times folks think of herbal medicine as being weird or fringe. Well, I've found that 
when working with clients one on one, everybody is different. There's some clients who really are interested in the clinical and pharmacological basis for why these herbs do what they do. I personally find that really fascinating, so I'm able to provide that information to them if that's the brain space that they're in. Other people want to hear the folklore and fairy tales about these plants. And that's what really turns them on, and, and that's what they really like gravitate towards. They want to feel like they're having a spiritual experience with another being that has a flower fairy associated with it that they're bringing into their life and into their space. Other people still want to know, like, how can I grow it? How can I bring it into my life? And so herbalists are really generalists in the sense that we have training in mythology and training in biochemistry. And the depth of my biochemical training is not the depth of a biochemist's biochemical training, but I like to think that I have a complete enough understanding to be able to competently talk about the biochemistry of medicinal plants to folks who are interested in it. And I also believe in meeting people where they're at in terms of their knowledge and in terms of what they like to talk about. So herbal medicine gives me the ability to convince people that it's useful using a range of different techniques. And for some folks, they don't want to sit in an office and talk about it. They want me to come and walk on their land and show them what kind of plants grow there and have that type of an experience with them. And then they want to be able to make their own personal relationships and figure this out on their own. And herbal medicine allows us to do that, which is incredible. Now, one of the ways that I've been able to accomplish the most change, I feel, is interfacing with physicians and with conventional medical care teams and getting them to trust me to be part of the care team and participate in their referral networks. In order to do that, herbalists need to have a strong grounding in science. There's just no way around that. But I like to inject things like, in certain cases, the clinical trial is not the best tool for figuring out how these plants do what they do because it's incomplete or needs to restrict too many variables and doesn't accurately represent the natural world the way an herbalist sees it. So I inject those little thoughts, you know, these ideas, um, this concept that maybe instead of using a drug, we could use a walk in the woods instead into the minds of the physicians with whom I interface. And I'll tell you that compared to 20 years ago, physicians are super open about this stuff. They want to know how it works. They want to know how to bring it um, to bear for their patients, but they don't have the training. So they're excited to partner with someone who can help their patients um, through that a little bit. So I don't know if it answers your question or not. Um, I don't think herbalists can sit on tradition only. I think we have to work at understanding the way to communicate the power of medicinal plants using science and chemistry. I really am convinced that we do because that's the dominant paradigm right now. And whether we like it or not, it's a language that we need to learn to speak. But herbalists have always been able to speak multiple languages and shift roles and shift spaces and places. It's been somewhat threatening historically to the powers that be. Um, from Paracelsus, way before Paracelsus and onward after that. But I, I do think we need to engage with the language of science at least a little bit as herbalists today. And there's a common way in the back. So I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. So the question is, is, as an herbalist, am I able to take the Blue Cross and Blue Shield card? And the answer to that is no, because herbalists don't exist and are not healthcare providers. So one of the recognizing that that is true and that many people are uninsured and underinsured, let alone having Blue Cross and Blue Shield, um, one of my main drives since I became an herbalist, starting with 2001 and the founding of the Sage Mountain Free Herbal Clinic, is to create free, low-cost, or gift-based ways to provide herbal medicine to folks who can't afford it. So I think it's really important to be able to do that. Plants, after all, give almost freely of themselves to us. And this idea of being able to give back both to the indigenous communities that provided us with the knowledge and to people who um, are underserved by the modern healthcare system or who don't have US currency as a resource, I think is really, really important. So um, thanks for bringing that up. But um, one of the things that is beautiful about herbal medicine is that I don't have to spend $250,000 to go through training to be an herbalist. Um, sometimes I don't have to spend anything at all. So I am able to charge less for a consultation than a physician might or a naturopathic physician might. I don't know if your doctor talks to someone like me or not, but there are many doctors in Burlington, Vermont, who talk to me and to other herbalists as well. And we work together as a team to help, particularly in like cancer cases, support the health and well-being of the patient. 
Um, and what's neat to see is that that's what doctors are about these days, right? It used to be less so historically. I feel like they were much more ideologically driven. But the crop of physicians that are coming out of medical schools today, I feel, are very open to doing what needs to be done to improve the health and well-being of their clients. Yeah. Oh, five minutes before the break. We might go maybe another 10 minutes or so before the break, but it'll be right around then, if that's okay. Thank you. Other comment? I'm just going to go back to radicchio and ask you really quick. Have you harvested the radicchio root, or is it better to get the wild chicory? So the question is, have, have we harvested the radicchio root, or is it better to get the wild chicory? And I've not ever taken radicchio root. I've always used the greens. But the chicory root from the wild chicory is an amazing bitter as well. And one of my favorite things to do with that is to harvest it, clean it, chop it up, and roast it in a cast iron skillet. If you chop it fairly fine into chunks, very small chunks, and roast it in a cast iron skillet until the nutty flavor begins to develop and it starts to turn brownish black, then you can take it off the skillet, dry it out, and mix it with coffee. And it is a great way to get that bitter support into your warm morning beverage and also reduce your caffeine content. This was something I learned from my dad. I hear they also do it in New Orleans quite a bit. But my dad in Italy growing up in World War II, coffee shortages were very, very common. And they would just do what they could, which was to roast those chicory roots and drink them as the morning beverage. Um, it's a great way to get digestive bitters into your life, especially if someone's a coffee drinker and they like that sort of stuff. You can brew it in a French press. You can brew it in a drip coffee maker. But it's the wild chicory root. Uh, I'd be curious what the radicchio root tastes like. My bet is that it'd be pretty good. Yeah, because in the vegetable farm, they do have radicchio root and the I'm sure chicory root. Uh-huh. Be worth a try. You could roast your radicchio roots and make a coffee substitute to sell at farmer's market. I think that's a great idea. Mix it with dandelion. Correct. Yep. So you always brew that, and as a, for a coffee, you would never just grind it up and stir it into like cocoa? It would be gritty. If you stirred it ground up chicory root into cocoa or into water, it'd be pretty gritty. You need to pass it through a filter or something like that. Or you're going to end up with basically the equivalent of coffee grounds in your mouth, which most people. Well, I mean, if that's your thing, I am not opposed. So the point was we can also add dandelion to the roasted coffee. And dandelion's got a little bit of a sweeter, sour kind of flavor, too, which not everyone is fond of. Chicory is a little more clean in terms of its bitterness. But dandelion root is like the quintessential herbal tonic. Every part of it, including the leaves, including the flower, are bitter. The root is the part that is most bitter. Right? And we harvest the root either in spring or in fall to make a bitter tonic like that guy with the roundup in his yard. And the difference between spring and dandelion root has to do with the amount of photosynthesis that the plant did over the course of the summer. The fall roots are starchier. They're loaded with inulin and prebiotic starches. So they make, because it's slightly sweeter, a great tea. So if you're going to do that roasted dandelion root for coffee, fall roots are really good. When you make a tincture of fall dandelion roots, it looks like a latte. It's kind of brownish tan and totally opaque and cloudy, full of those prebiotic starches. Now, because of that, I wouldn't make a tincture, because alcohol can damage those starches if it's too high. And also, you want large quantities of it. So the fall roots, I like to make a decoction, meaning simmering that root for you know, five minutes or so in water, and then drinking that tea as a morning beverage, maybe with a little cream or half and half if you're into that sort of thing. The spring root, because all the starches have been used to put out the new green spring growth, is starch poor. So it's much more bitter. And when you make a tincture of it, it's amber brown and it's much more clear than the tincture that is made with the fall roots. It lacks those prebiotic starches and it's much more bitter. So if you're trying to make a bitter tonic, the spring dandelion roots are the best. Does that make sense? All the st starch reserves have been used as energy to put out new green growth in the spring, not much starch in the root, photosynthesizes all summer long, puts all those starches into roots for storage. You've got great prebiotic starch like inulin for your gut flora in the fall dandelion root. And as a result, fall does great in tea, spring does great in alcohol as a tincture. Generally, the roots are starchier at the end of summer. So I think that can be somewhat generalized. Oh. I wouldn't decoct yellow dock. It's going to be nasty to drink that much fluid. So it's one of the ones that I prefer as a tincture because it's just more bitter. 
Um, but yes, generally speaking, if you want uh, burdock as a bitter tonic, take it in the spring of its second year. If you want it as um, prebiotic starch, gastrointestinal tonic, fall of its first year. Yeah. You totally do. It's a nice, it's a little more gentle. It's not as bitter. It's not as full-bodied, but you totally do. And for me, again, trying to meet clients where they're at, what's going to let you get dandelion root into your life? If it's a complex multi-stage process that takes an hour every morning, and no, it's not going to work. But if all you have to do is put it in your drip coffee maker or your French press and it takes two seconds and it's already built into your routine, even if you get only 75% of the chemistry, I think the fact that you're getting some of the chemistry instead of zero, because the previous method is so complicated, makes it work. OK. This is a very safe way to start with bitters. We don't see pharmaceutical interactions with dandelion. We don't see it aggravate ulcers or heartburn, which some of the stronger bitters can do and need to be used with caution in those cases. It's a great place to start for the bitter naive, OK? <clears throat> yeah. So because bitters stimulate, the question is that we talk about how bitters can help with heartburn, but how is it that they can aggravate heartburn? And generally speaking, um, they only really aggravate it in the short term, but because they stimulate all digestive juices, including hydrochloric acid in the stomach, if someone has had chronic heartburn for a long period of time or has had a peptic or gastric ulcer for a long period of time, when you give gentian in high doses by itself right away, and the valve hasn't learned to close back up again at the top of the stomach or at the pylorus, then you run the risk of increasing acid production before the valve has been retoned, and that spillover can make things worse. Does that make sense? So would you, as a suggestion is, especially if someone has heartburn or ulcers or something like that, and they, bitters is the long-term fix for that person. Should we start more gently with dandelion greens or radicchio or small amounts of dandelion root before going into the stronger bitters? And the answer is yes. And, and it, it points to really having some compassion for the folks we work with and meeting them where they're at, starting with something gentle, introducing them to the bitter habit, and eventually moving um, a little bit beyond that into something stronger once their physiology has been able to tolerate it. But going in with lots of gentian right away for someone who has strong active heartburn might make them run for the hills. And again, you're going to end up with zero herbs in their life as a result, unfortunately. <coughs> I want to talk about milk thistle really briefly because it brings in the next piece of what bitters are really good for. Do you have a comment before that? I have a question about you talked about the valve. Yeah. And so what tells that? Okay. So there's a couple of cues for valves at the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, basically, all the gut is lined with smooth muscle, right? Um, how is it that we poop? It's this thing called peristalsis, which is this muscle contraction wave that basically milks the poop out of our colon, right? But that doesn't just happen in the colon. It starts with swallowing. What is swallowing? Swallowing is muscles pushing the food down, right? And when you stretch the smooth muscle, the muscle behind it responds by contracting. So the first trigger for contraction of muscle in the gut is stretch. The next trigger, particularly in the valve, so the throat's here, right, esophagus, and we've got the stomach, and this is the pylorus. The, after the pylorus, you have your duodenum, and then eventually your small intestine, and then the colon wraps around all of that. Here and here are two sort of, kind of like the anal sphincter, right, areas of particularly tight rings of muscle that can close all the way down to nothing. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about a valve. It's not actually a flopping valve like this. It's a ring of tight muscle, OK? So if that muscle is loose and floppy, material can spill up more easily. The two main cues, one is physiologic. The other is sort of reflex-based. The first cue is acidity itself. Hydrochloric acid stimulates that valve to contract, just the same way lemon juice makes your mouth scrunch up. Acidity causes smooth muscle contraction in the lower esophageal sphincter. So if you have heartburn and you take antacids, you're removing one of the major cues to get your valve to shut down. It's great for people who make antacids. <laughs> right? 
And what you find is that long-term antacid users, their valve doesn't work anymore. So anytime they eat anything and they lie back, it just all sloshes up into the throat. So this is the reason why sometimes folks take apple cider vinegar for heartburn, which seems totally counterintuitive, but is actually really good because it provides a gentle, acidic cue to stimulate the closure of this valve. And that's direct, right? Hydrogen ions or protons on this valve cause it to contract, which is what acidity is. The second cue comes from the fact that these valves and all of the smooth muscle in the gut are connected to nerve tissue that modulates the degree of contractility all throughout the GI tract, and particularly the vagus nerve, which is a division of the parasympathetic nervous system. The vagus nerve also stimulates the contraction of this muscle, the contraction of this muscle, and the ongoing peristaltic movement of the GI tract, which is why when you're under stress, your food either all leaves, right, if you're under severe stress, or just stops moving, right, and everything feels a little like stagnant, and you're burping and things are fermenting. Anyway, the vagus regulates the level of muscular contraction throughout the GI tract. And now on your tongue, if you apply something bitter, it sends a reflex to the brain that bounces back down via the vagus nerve and doesn't just lead to things like the pancreas secreting digestive juices in the tuodenum, hydrochloric acid getting secreted, saliva getting secreted, and bile from the liver getting secreted, right? It also leads to greater tone in the vagus nerve, which means greater contractility in these valves. So that's the second way to get that valve to contract a little better is by providing something that tastes bitter. And so when folks do have active heartburn or ulcers, I say sometimes, just swish the bitters around your mouth. Taste them really well and then spit it out. You don't have to actually swallow it. The reflex carried by the vagus nerve is sufficient to help contract this valve. And in Italy, people use amari or bitters after meals all the time to help with indigestion and to help relieve heartburn in the moment by scrunching that valve down without inhibiting hydrochloric acid, which I think is key. A couple of comments. So the question is, is this the same thing we should think about if someone has heartburn because of too much acid, and as opposed to too little? And I will say, the people who have heartburn because of too much acid, in my experience, are rare. Most people who have heartburn, it's not an acid problem. It's a valve patency slash overeating problem. Sometimes the first reason people get heartburn is they like have a massive Thanksgiving meal then they lounge back to watch this game and there's some reflux happening because there's just too much material in the stomach. And once that happens a couple of times, it can have erosive or damaging effects here, kind of making the problem worse, especially if you continue overeating. But if there truly is a case of hyperchloridia or excessive hydrochloric acid production, then in those cases we might need to work with um, temporarily some things like small amounts of baking soda or other alkalizing agents to help counteract that and try to get to the root of the problem of why that person is overproducing hydrochloric acid. But in my experience, it's been the exception rather than the rule. Another comment? That's a great way to start, yeah. Um, and just experience that bitter flavor without swallowing alcohol down your throat. Not going to make it feel good. And it may be far gone enough that there's like been some erosion going on, and, and so it's going to take some time. I would suggest a tea made with this other herb called meadowsweet. And meadowsweet is an anti-inflammatory, slightly astringent, super soothing herb that is also really safe. And that would heal, right? Other people will use calendula or even small amounts of comfrey or slippery elm or other soothing herbs, right, as teas while experiencing the bitter flavor to do some healing and repairing of that um, lower part of the throat. Okay, I do want to talk about milk thistle really briefly because this plant brings us to the next, I think, important piece of what bitters have to offer, which is to improve liver health and the ability of the liver to detoxify. This is the only known antidote to death cap mushroom poisoning. Milk thistle, silymarin, death cap mushroom liquefies the liver. Absolutely. This is called Syllabum Marianum, also known as Blessed Virgin's Thistle or St. Mary's Thistle. That's why Marianum in the species name.
The seeds of this plant are traditionally used for liver health, but the leaves made a great, make a great digestive bitter and also help support um, liver health as well. I'll tell you, it's really, really easy to grow. I would say almost too easy to grow and considered a noxious weed in California, right? Because it's super spiky and takes over everywhere. But here in the Northeast, the growing season is short enough, at least in Vermont, that you can keep it pretty well behaved and it doesn't set seed everywhere and take over. And it's got this beautiful electric purple flower that matures into these amazing seeds that you can grind up, add to grain at one to two tablespoons per day to support liver health. And by support liver health, I mean cirrhosis, hepatitis, Right? Really active, intense liver disorders where milk thistle has been shown over and over again to be helpful. If it does go to seed here, if you start it indoors and you plant it out in May, you can get seed by the time you get to late September. In a way that does not become a noxious weed, no, because even if those seeds fall down, they won't germinate till May, and those won't ever be able to set seed. It's too late. You have to start it early, indoors. Yes? Milk thistle has these beautiful white splotches on the leaves that you can't really see. Most likely, what we have here is bull thistle, right? And bull thistle leaves also make good digestive bitters if you've got a real thick pair of leather gloves that you can use to harvest those leaves. But the tincture is good, right? Because you can put it all in a jar, spines and all, steep it in the alcohol, and then strain it out through a fine mesh strainer, and you've got a great bitter tincture without having to deal with all the spines. Yellow dock is another really good bitter. Um, this is a leaf of yellow dock with an interesting, anyone know what that is? I don't really know what it is, some kind of bug thing. Um, but the root of yellow dock is a digestive bitter that is particularly indicated for people who are trying to get off stimulant laxatives if their bowel health is a concern. And bitters help regulate bowel health as well. So people taking laxatives, eventually their colon relies on the laxative to poop. And laxatives can become very habit forming as a result. And so what we do instead is train them off of that using um, a plant like yellow dock that's also a really good digestive bitter. And um, I want to end with mugwort, which is the safer cousin of wormwood, both to recognize that um, it's a good digestive bitter that is a leaf rather than a root, but also bring us back, as wormwood's name suggests, to the use of digestive bitters to help rebalance gut flora and also deal with unwanted pieces of the gut flora, in particular with wormwood, helminths or worms. Wormwood, with its intense bitterness, was often used by herbalists to clear and flush out worms from the GI tract. Now, mugwort doesn't do that, but it's still a fantastic bitter. And we think part of the reason it's called mugwort is that it might have been used as a beer bittering agent before the English church passed the purity laws in the 1600s. Those purity laws say hops only shall be a bittering agent. And for any of you who know about the medicinal qualities of hops, you recognize that this is very smart government crowd control measure. Mugwort, yarrow, and heather, which were traditional bittering agents in beer, make people wild and crazy. They stay up all night, sometimes destroying public property. <coughs> hops makes people docile, calm, and sleepy. And so people who drink beer with hops, and this double IPA craze, you all. If I have, have has anyone heard of Hetty Topper? This like Vermont double IPA that's really strong. Anyway, if I have one of those, I am asleep in half an hour. It's like super strong. I have low tolerance for ethanol as it is, but all that hops just puts me right to sleep like a baby. I'm not gonna go destroying any public property. One of the times, um, there was this guy at our, at our um, free herbal first aid tent in, at the Rainbow Gatherings. We call him Sakahachi Steve, and he really liked his alcohol. And whenever he came back to the tent, because you can't have alcohol at the Rainbow Gatherings, you have to go out of the Rainbow Gathering into the parking lot where all the cars are, which is called A Camp, where people who like alcohol drink their alcohol, right? And then he would come back from A Camp at like 2 in the morning when we were serving herbal tea to the late night crowd. And if he had had whiskey or anything like that, he would destroy the tent. Like one time he threw a couple pallets onto the fire and burned a hole in our tarp. Anyway, but we could tell any time he'd had beer because he would come home and go to sleep like a baby. Anyway, hops. But mugwort is a different kind of bitter. It makes you a little bit wild and crazy. It's also considered to be a dream-enhancing herb. 
um, and related to Artemis, the hunter goddess, right? Um, and also a queen of many important lunar medicinal plants, including mugwort and wormwood. But think about it as a great digestive bitter. It's kind of sweet, too. It has this piney camphorous quality. It makes a great tea. So if you want to have you know, four or six ounces of a tea as a digestive bitter before your meal, mugwort is a great choice. And so just to summarize, um, bitterness can indicate phytonutrient density for us, right? Almost all of our important phytonutrients, especially polyphenols like flavonoids, taste bitter. So the more bitter something tastes, we can reliably say the higher its phytonutrient density. Think about the phytonutrient density of carrot peel versus carrot flesh. And think about the chemical difference between those two and the flavor difference between those two. And you'll recognize what I'm talking about here. It might also indicate danger. Some of our strongest poisons are bitter. And as a result, the body activates all of its processing and detoxifying ability when it experiences the bitter flavor. That's why all of those secretions increase. That's why all of that liver detox increases. Traditionally, we use them for digestion and for liver function. Our modern research shows a little bit of immunologic protection from bitters and real help on sugar metabolism and appetite regulation, that 20 to 30% less food. I contend that part of the reason we have diabetes and obesity today is not just the ubiquitous presence of sugar, but the complete absence of bitterness. So it's a great thing for me when a client comes into clinic and says, I'm trying to get on this low carb diet and it's just hard. I'm like, I believe you it's hard. Sugar is everywhere. It's like trying to tell a smoker to quit by taking them to Paris in 1920. <laughs> so rather than saying like, oh, you're bad because you can't control your will, I say, don't worry about it. Think about having some carbs. It's fine. Don't worry about it if you cheat, but have a little bit of bitter before. And what tends to happen is that slowly over time, it becomes a lot easier for these folks over the course of a couple weeks to not consume carbohydrates because the bitters really modulate that desire for sweetness. And the reason our desire for sweetness is running rampant is because of nothing to oppose it in the form of bitterness. So getting herbal bitters into someone's life, you're really doing them a great service. We consider them tonic because it gives good input, right? All those phytonutrients we were talking about. And we talk about these bitter medicinal herbs as being the original heirlooms completely unhybridized, right? untouched by human manipulation. They modulate digestive function, including secretions and also the movement of food through the gut. They definitely encourage elimination, bile in the liver and bowel, so they hit that check mark as well. And finally, the ecological component, which goes back to like, how are we going to get the collective will to change the world? You make different food choices. You move away from the tyranny of sugar. You make different agricultural choices you start letting some weeds into your garden and maybe appreciating them a little bit. And our relationship to weeds changes. Rather than thinking about Roundup, we think about, oh, this is a helpful ally. And that subtle shift, it's actually really profound and really powerful. So when we come back, I'm going to start a little salve with some calendula. Um, we're going to check in with our tincture. And we'll talk about aromatic plants for mood and stress. And we'll talk about our sour and our sweet tonics, our berries and our immunologic adaptogens. So, Let's, I've kept you way too late. Can we take 10 minutes? We come back at 11. Thank you. <laughs> Yo. Well, not really, but sort of. Yeah, these are some places you can go to. A Radical is the quote unquote blog that I occasionally publish to much less now because I tend to publish a lot of my articles on herbal medicine on Urban Moonshine's blog, which you can get at at urbanmoonshine.com. Okay. And you teach, right? Less so now than I used to. Oh, okay. Do you have any online? I have some online modules on phytopharmacology through the American Herbalist Guild and also through the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine. And Mountain Rose Herbs recorded a bunch of videos of me like telling fairy tales. Um, I forget what else. I'm sure there's other stuff out there. Okay. There's definitely, if you go onto YouTube, like NOFA talks that I've given and other things like that. I honestly don't know. I should probably keep track of it a little better. Okay. But, but well, if you go to urbanmoonshine.com, there's Urban Moonshine Herb School. And that's 16 hours of me talking about 30 or 40 different plants, basic preparation techniques, a lot of supplementary written material. And it is organized as like an intro herb course. Yeah. So you can find that at Urban Moonshine. 
Um, this is where I occasionally post class handouts, like I'll post the handouts for this conference here. And this is just sometimes place where I write about stuff. OK, um, one last comment on bidders, a uh, good point that was brought up um, during the break. It's definitely helpful for us in terms of our relationship to food and sugar to consume bitter plants. But I don't want to get us to the point where we're eliminating carbohydrates from our diet. Um, I have really mixed feelings about that. Re reducing the amount of carbohydrates we eat is probably a wise choice because we tend to consume more carbohydrates than we probably need to in this particular diet. And bitters can help with that. But I don't want you to get the sense that um, Paleolithic humans didn't consume starches because they consumed a lot of starches, both from roots and tubers and also grains. What I don't want us to do is have refined carbohydrates for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. right? Um, moderate that a little bit. And bitters can certainly help. I don't want us to have dessert at every meal. right? Bitters can certainly help with that. Those are the types of habits that the clients I'm working with are trying to break. Yeah? The question is, what about lemon juice? Would that have the same effect as bitters? And lemon juice does have some crossover with bitters in the sense that it's acidic, so it can help astringe the valve. And it also is what we call a cholagog, or something that stimulates the release of bile from the liver. So having lemon juice and warm water in the morning is a great way to kind of wake up digestion in a similar way. It doesn't have the same um, immunologic or digestive secretion function or sugar metabolism balance function that bitters do. But it is another great way to support digestion and liver health. So that's a great point. Thank you. Comment, yep. So this is a, a common question. What if we put honey in our bitter tea? What if we add sweetness to the bitter preparations that we make? Urban Moonshine makes this product called maple bitters, where we put a little maple syrup in there. We call it bitters with training wheels. But you know, it's, it's totally fine to do so. The point is that the bitter chemistry is still going to interface with the bitter taste receptors and achieve a lot of the goals that we've talked about. Um, that said, if you can actually taste good bitterness fully, that's good too. But really, having looked at the history of bitter preparations across the world, and particularly in the Mediterranean basin, I find there's a general template for digestive bitters. And it doesn't just include bitterness. Usually what you see are three legs to the stool when you're talking about bitters. You've definitely got your bitter stuff. But then you usually have something that's aromatic or has a personality. Think about Campari, for example. It's bittered with gentian, and it certainly is bitter, but orange peel, right? Orange peel gives that personality and that zing. Fernet Branca has some mint sometimes to give that. Many other different digestive bitters include things like fennel, for example, or anise as their personality or aromatic flavoring agent. And then the third leg of the stool is actually sweet. And people have found that adding a little honey or a little maple syrup or a sweet herb, right, like burdock that has some starchiness, can balance out this formula really, really well, make it a lot more palatable. So think about Campari again. Campari is a liqueur. It has sweetness in it. So does Aperol. So adding some sweetness is not only not a bad idea, it is historically something that has been a consistent part of digestive bitter formulations. So it's a good idea to put that in there. And if you taste it, the flavor evolves. Usually it's bitter, then you taste the personality, then it's rounded by sweetness giving you kind of a satisfying end. And then after the sweetness dissipates, the lingering bitter remains. So next time you try some Campari or an Aperol Spritz, take a second to really give the full sensory experience a chance to evolve on your palate, because it's really pretty cool. Um, and, and then that linger bitter, lingering bitter at the end is what, for me, is just like the most satisfying thing. Couple comments, yeah. The question is, is Campari effective as a pre-meal bitter? Yes, it is. <laughs> so you know, I joke around how herbal medicine is coming to the mainstream through cocktail culture and cannabis. And I never thought that would have been the case. But you know, I'll take whatever. Whatever. So yes, a little bit of Campari and some sparkling water is a great way to bring digestive bitters into your life. Yeah. Have you worked with anyone who is a hyper bitter taster, like has a DNA that 
So have, have I worked with anyone who's a super taster, who has incredible sensitivity to bitterness and other flavors as well? And the answer is yes, I have. And these folks tend to be really, really sensitive to the bitter taste and tend to require substantially lower doses. And bitter takes up a smaller part of that formulation for their personalized digestive bitters. It so happens that Colleen, the former Urban Moonshine production manager that I was telling you about, is a super taster, which is great for us because she can pull out flavors in the raw material and like in the final products that like my palate, which is not very sophisticated, just can't do. So I love the super tasters, but you do have to be a little gentle with them on the bitter flavor. Coincidentally, it's also interesting to note that the bitter taste receptor has a range of different genetic isoforms to it that help us understand why certain people are more sensitive to bitter compared to other people. Also, kiddos have much greater density of bitter taste receptors on their tongue and in their guts than adults do. And we think that's because their metabolism is less able to detoxify poisons. They're smaller. A poison could have a more profound effect on them, so they want a stronger aversive response to any potentially poisonous molecules that taste really bitter. Eventually, the bitter taste receptor density goes down, and the kiddo says, wow, I don't think broccoli is actually that bad. <laughs> Maybe. So can you talk about, on the note with the liquids and everything, when someone, when you're taking a lot of tinctures and they're wanting to like, use a bitter tincture in the morning and like, before every meal, how do you modulate <laughs> yeah. So the question is, um, what about not getting drunk with your herbal tinctures and digestive bitters that you're taking three times a day before every meal? And also, as a corollary, what about people who maybe are trying to stay sober or are sensitive to alcohol for other reasons or can't consume alcohol for whatever reason, be it personal, religious, I don't know. And those are really good points. I will say most bitters are in this tincture form, blended along those formulation lines, are given at doses of about a half teaspoon. In a half teaspoon of a bitter preparation, there's as much alcohol as there is in a bottle of kombucha. If you're having one or two kombuchas a day, you can definitely get away with having one or two bitter um, doses a day at that low dose range. Now, Italians like to drink an ounce of bitter liqueurs after a meal. And you know, you do that a couple times a day, you definitely will feel an ethanol intoxication from it. So if you don't like doing that, my suggestion is to take a stronger tincture-based bitter rather than a bitter liqueur like a Barolo Chinato or an Averna or a Montenegro or some of these Amari that people take after meals and mix like a teaspoon of a bitter tincture with some sparkling water instead. And you can sip that after a meal as a bookend to the meal and as a dessert alternative and it's really effective. Now for people who don't like using alcohol, there's a couple of options. The easiest is to use apple cider vinegar instead of alcohol as your extraction base. So you can put bitter herbs into apple cider vinegar. They don't extract as well as they do in alcohol, but they extract okay. And then, especially if you're dealing with heartburn and gut stuff, apple cider vinegar is not a bad choice anyway as a base. Then you have your bitter herb on top of that. That's decent, and it works well as a digestive tonic. The other option is to make a bitter formula like this, and then to put it in a double boiler, and simmer off until it's only about a third of the original volume, and then replace with apple cider vinegar or replace with vegetable glycerin. And that provides a, a low, super low alcohol product for people who, for whatever reason, need to avoid it. Okay, a couple comments, yeah. So that third um, uh, preparation, is, would that have a better bitter component than just the apple cider vinegar as far as strength? The solvent replacement is stronger than the apple cider vinegar because ethanol penetrates the plant cell material more effectively than apple cider vinegar does. So if, if you want to make it... You know, a lot of alcohol, that, that third preparation probably more effective. It's the strongest. It doesn't mean that a, steeping a bunch of gentian and ginger in apple cider vinegar doesn't make a very effective bitter thing. Yeah. It does. Yeah. But you get more complete extraction by using alcohol and then evaporating off the alcohol and replacing it with something that keeps the solution stable. Did you have a comment? Okay, a comment in the back? I am familiar with Jaegermeister and it is similar. 
It is similar. Um, I don't mind it. A lot of people are very turned off by the strong anise flavor. So to me, it's really, and, and it's bitter. It's also bitter, but not quite as bitter as some of those Italian amari are. It's a little more on the aromatic side of things. If people like that, you know, it's a pick your poison, quote unquote. Um, whatever it is that allows the bitter plants to get into your life. Now, I don't want to encourage people to like take Jägermeister shots three times a day. I, I don't know that that's the, what I'm really advocating for here. But it is a good aromatic bitter. Um, there's also Unterbergen, um, which is another much more bitter version of um, the Jägermeister that also comes from Germany and is a great digestive bitter. Unterbergen, which means under the mountain in German. It comes in these little tiny bottles. Anyway, everywhere in the world, except the United States, you find these bitter preparations as part of the culture. Right? So you know whether you're talking about Ayurveda and a bitter melon um, chutney, for example, that uses this same formula right? with like orange and tamarind, bitter melon, and sweet marmalade, same formula taken as a chutney during meals whatever it is that you like. And, and as soon as you start digging in any traditional cuisine system, you'll find bitter preparations are part of it. Because humans aren't dumb. They know what helps their digestion. They know what helps them feel good. Um, and they incorporate it into traditional systems. We don't do that here because, as Susan Weed pointed out, we are immature <laughs> in our culinary choices in this particular culture. So um, the next class of plants I want to talk about are um, the aromatic plants. And I love this picture from um, Mural in Egypt because I think what's happening is this person is giving flowers to this other person. And I even imagine this other person smelling those flowers and being like, ooh, that smells so great. And I personally feel like it's really hard to stay pissed off at someone if they present me with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> partly because they're beautiful, but partly because of their smell. And have you ever noticed when you walk into a new room and there's a new smell there, or when a person walks into a room and they have a smell on them, sometimes those smells are a little weird, but still, how it immediately like captures your attention? You can't deny a new smell. Now, your brain develops a tolerance to that smell really quickly, so you stop smelling it after a while. But when you first detect a new smell, it's impossible to deny it. And sometimes it brings back this flood of memories that are associated with that smell in a way that is more powerful than almost anything else. And the reason is there's this amazing physiologic difference between the sense of smell and all other senses. In fact, people say smell is the first sense in the sense that it doesn't go through our brain censorship unit called the thalamus. Have you all ever like wondered where your keys are? And you're wondering and wondering where they are. And you're like standing right there. And you ask your partner, God, I can't figure out where the heck I put my keys. And they're like, they're right there on the table. Have you ever done that? You're looking for something, and it's right in front of your face, and you literally can't see it. Our brain is constantly pruning sensory input from our consciousness. Because if we were truly aware of all the sensory input, we would be overwhelmed by it. We cannot handle all of the sensory input that's coming our way. From our clothes, right? from everything that's going on inside, from the sights and from the sounds, we have to tune that business out. Large, amount, large amounts of it are tuned out. And the organ in our brain that is responsible for doing so is called the thalamus. It's in the central part of the brain in an area called the limbic system. And the thalamus takes that inf visual information that's coming to the retina that says, there are my keys. And it's saying, you don't really need to know that right now for whatever reason. Smell goes directly to the olfactory cortex without passing through the thalamus. It is non-censored. It is uncensorable. So even though someone might be saying your name and you can't hear it because you're paying attention to something else, or your keys might be here and you can't see it, if someone puts a smell into your olfactory consciousness, it's undeniable. So what presenting someone with roses does and experiencing that smell is it brings them into the present moment right there. No wonder perfumery is so associated with seduction, right? Because if you can create a smell, 
that immediately takes people away from whatever it is they're thinking about and focused on that smell, which is what smell does, then bam, you've made an impression. You've made an impact. You have entered that person's consciousness in a way that fancy clothing or nice words or even touch might not be able to do. So smell is really powerful that way. It's considered the oldest sense. So if we have plants that have strong smells and we bring them into someone's room or into someone's life, which is really what the art and science of aromatherapy is all about, right? We're immediately bringing them into a mindful place by grabbing them by the consciousness and saying, hey, be here now. That's exactly what smells do for us. So think about how human beings use smelly plants. Strong smelling plants are used in almost all type of ritual and ceremony. I once attended a Buddhist wedding ceremony where the first 20 minutes was devoted to prayer for the incense. Where they acknowledged that the incense was there, they thanked the people who made it, they thanked the plants that were there, and they asked the incense to please bring everybody who's here into this moment now so we can be present for the bride and groom. And then they lit the incense and we smelled it. And boy, were we there, right? We were there. And that's really useful if you're trying to encourage a spiritual experience or if you're interested in crowd control and creating a sense of gel in a large group of people. So religion has exploited the power of aromatic plants throughout history too. Whenever I smell frankincense, I am back in the basilica of my childhood listening to the Latin mass. And I bet everyone who was there with me, when they smell frankincense, they have that same experience. It's gelled in my head. And when the chanting happened in church and the frankincense was burned, it unites the consciousness of all the people that are there. And when human beings unite in their consciousness around a central united purpose, boy, we can accomplish some pretty incredible things, both for good and for bad, right? And smells have been really used to guide that. That's why we throw lavender flowers and rose petals down at weddings, right? Traditionally, aromatic plants were used in childbirth, spritzed in the room, or used as aromatic washes for the mom. And also during times of death, flowers like lilies that have strong intoxicating aromas. Again, to be like, something's happening here. Let's be present together. So that's what aromatic plants can do for us. And how much more so when we take them internally instead of just sniffing or smelling them, okay? So I wanna start, um, before I get into them, I'm just gonna put a little olive oil in here, okay? This is a crock pot, you all know that. Crock pots are common and useful tools. I use mine for making bone broth, but I have a separate special one that I use for making salve. And you can make salve using a double boiler. What is a salve? It's essentially an oil-based herbal preparation that has a thickener in it. That thickener can be I start with coconut oil or I start with lard, something that's solid at room temperature. And then I warm it up in the crock pot, put herbs in it, strain the herbs out, and let it re-solidify later. Or it can be what we're doing, which is to use an oil like olive oil. This is not the best quality olive oil, just by the way, but still, it will suffice for tropical preparations. And we thicken it with beeswax, okay? And the whole point of thickening it is that you don't always want to rub like vast quantities of oil on yourself, like if you have a little burn or a scrape or a wound. So the thickness of the salve allows us to put it in a little jar, then we scoop out a little pot, we can use it as a lip balm, we can put it on wounds, etc. So I'm just going to warm up some olive oil. And um, in terms of recipes, thickness of salve is a pet peeve of mine. Have you ever like run into a, a lip balm that melts when you put it in the car? And like... Oh. Or have you ever run into a salve that's so hard it feels like you need a screwdriver to get a little piece of that stuff out and actually use it on your body? So I want the right amount of thickener. And it's actually really simple to remember if you're using olive oil and beeswax or oil in general in beeswax. Um, let's say you're using, like we'll do here, we're going to use 20 fluid ounces of olive oil. Um, your beeswax is going to be two fluid or two ounces by weight. And that's simply it. In my opinion, that's one of the best ratios. If you want it a little softer, use a little less beeswax. If you want it a little harder, use a little more beeswax. But it's that one to 10 ratio of weight of beeswax to volume 
of um, olive oil. If you're into the metric system, it works too. You know, for every 10 grams by weight of beeswax, you use 100 milliliters of whatever your fluid is. Okay? So that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to put 20 ounces of olive oil into the crock pot, and I'm going to use 2 ounces by weight of beeswax to thicken it. But before we do that, I want to infuse one of my favorite topical use herbs into that olive oil. It turns out it's also a really good aromatic plant, though it isn't used for stress and mood quite as much as I would like, um, and that's calendula. Calendula is a great healer of all tissue, both outside of the donut and inside the donut. And by donut, I just remind us that we have a big hole running through us. And well, all parts of the calendula plant are pretty sticky and covered in resin, but by far the stickiest and most covered in resin is the flower. So generally speaking, I use the flower. Although, the, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to putting some leaves in there as well. So this is flower from Vermont, um, nice, beautiful yellow calendula. Now, just because calendula is yellow doesn't mean that it is sticky and resinous, right? So some of the resina varieties are actually more like pale yellow instead of this bright orange. Um, and they're super sticky and resinous. If you're making a salve, what you really want is the, the resin quantity. The thing that's making it orange is carotenoids, which topically are ah, neither here nor there. But one of the things that's really useful about calendula internally is that it helps soothe and heal like in that chronic heartburn situation we were talking about or gastric ulcers or things like inflammatory bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Calendula heals the skin, but it also heals the inside of the donut hole. Okay. So just putting this oil in the crock pot is pretty simple and easy to do, right? And then you want to put the herbal material in there. And I'll tell you, if all you use is olive oil and beeswax, you're still making a pretty medicinal product, right? Some people don't like olive oil to make an infused oil because massage therapists, for example, feel it's too greasy. So they'll use something a little more thin, like a grapeseed oil, for example. Um, you can infuse herbs into that as well. But for a salve where we don't really care, we're going to make this thick product anyway, I love olive oil. It's got polyphenols in it. It's antiseptic to begin with. It's just a healing substance on its own. It's going to be even better once we infuse these calendula flowers in there. Okay? So that's the next step that I'm going to do. So this is a situation where we could weigh it out if we wanted to, like we did with the tincture, to create a consistent recipe. But the thing that's important for me to do is just make sure that all of those calendula flowers are completely covered and that there's not so many in there that they're sticking up and out of the oil. Okay? So putting a couple good handfuls there for that 20 ounces of olive oil seems to be able to do the trick. We're just going to let that infuse now for a while. <coughs> Cover it up. And the secret here that many people don't know about, and I could be wrong, probably a lot of you do, but you can put fresh things in there and you can actually put tinctures into your oil base, both to make an infused oil or to make a salve. You can put super strong tea in there too. And you might say, well, geez, water and oil don't mix. What are you doing? And you could be creating pockets of anaerobic, watery stuff inside your salve where botulism could develop. Are you nuts? <laughs> well, if you put watery material or tinctures into your crock pot or into your double boiler when you're infusing the oil with that stuff, what you'll find is it starts to bubble and simmer. And that's water boiling up and out of the oil. And if you just let that continue until the bubbling and simmering stops, all of the water or water and alcohol are gone. And all the herbal extractives are in the oil. So you can, if you really want to make a concentrated salve, pre-extract with alcohol to make a strong tincture, then just put that right into the oil. And that ensures that all of the constituents remain in the oil while all of the watery stuff boils off. It usually takes, depending on your batch size, only about an hour or so for that process to finish up. So it's a really neat sort of salve making or infused oil making secret that I actually use all the time um, and that is a great way to make a super potent punchy salve without having to directly infuse the herbs this way. Yeah. Correct, that's a very good point. You want to make sure you take the lid off so that everything can boil off. If you're using dry herbs, keep the lid on it because sometimes volatile oils will circulate and you want them to try and stay in the oil, right? So if you can keep the lid on, that's great. 
If you're using a double boiler, that might be a little harder to do. Um, but some double boilers do have lids that you can put on that second one. Yeah? What type of herb would not be appropriate for salve? What type of herb would not be appropriate for salve? I mean, I can't really think of one. Um, there's some herbs that you really don't have much of a benefit topically, but it's not like it would be inappropriate to put them in salve. Um, I'm even trying to think of, like, I don't know that I would ever make a gentian root salve. But that said, the research that they're finding now on bitter taste receptors in the upper airway and sinus cavity being stimulated in part of therapy for chronic sinus infections, maybe you do want to make a gentian root salve that you can put up there to help with chronic inflammation in the nasal passages, for example. But like gentian root, I don't know. Now, it's not inappropriate, but I don't really know what I would use a gentian root salve for. Yeah. So that's a really good point. Um, is there an ideal temperature for infusing herbs into oil? Or is there a temperature that's too high? There definitely is a temperature that's too high. You do not want to fry your herbs. The really only, the temperature that you want is the temperature that is sufficient to melt the beeswax, okay? You can make an infused oil by just putting herbs in a jar of olive oil and putting it in a sunny window for a week and then straining it, just like you would with a tincture, okay? But if you fry and crisp the herbs, you A, could damage chemical constituents, and B, just like you could potentially even burn the herbs and turn them brown, right? And make your salve really kind of nasty. So that's a danger with the crock pot, where if you turn it all the way up to high, it can get pretty darn high. But the beauty of the double boiler is it puts an upper limit on the temperature of the oil, which is about 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the boiling point of water and the temperature of that steam, right? So that's a great way to stay safe. If you're at 200 to 212, no worries, right? Once you get up to 300, then you start getting a little bit worried about it. All right, yeah. So for a more like off-grid, low-tech version, can you, like you were talking about like infuse, like fill a jar with, with dried calendula or fresh calendula and olive oil and put it in the sun or is the UV gonna damage that? So the question is, what about when you're not using electricity and you just want to use some very simple, traditional techniques for making an oil infusion? You can use dry calendula. I wouldn't use fresh calendula because in that case, we don't have enough heat to be able to simmer off the water. There's one exception, and that is fresh St. John's wort can be infused into oil fresh and, in fact, should be infused into oil fresh. And the use of St. John's wort infused oil is primarily for two things. Puncture wounds, it's anti-tetanus, strong activity against tetanobacteria from St. John's wort. And the second is neuropathic pain, numbness and tingling associated with nerve damage, either in situations where there's been an amputation or, for example, in diabetic neuropathy or neuropathy associated with some chemotherapeutic drugs. St. John's wort oil rubbed into the soles of the feet is nice. That's one herb that you should extract fresh in oil, and it's so amazing to do, it turns the oil blood red. And dry St. John's wort doesn't do that in the same way. Herbalists talk about St. John's Day or St. Jones Day, which is midsummer, the summer solstice, and that's when St. John's wort starts to bloom. It looks yellow like the sun, but it hides the sun's wound. Because on the summer solstice, the sun is mortally wounded, and its vitality decreases over the second half of the year until we get to about now-ish, right? And that wound is represented by the blood red color of the St. John's wort. When you squeeze the flower bud and the juice, red juice comes out, or when you infuse it into oil and it turns blood red, okay? So no fresh herbs with the exception of St. John's wort when you're infusing them in a sunny windowsill. And does the UV damage them? It does if you leave it there for like three months, but the week seems to be about the sweet spot to be able to get enough warmth from the sun to circulate and extract and not do enough UV damage. So I feel fine about leaving it even outside on a stone in your summer garden for a week um, to infuse and then bringing it back in and straining it out. I don't think you get a lot of UV damage during that time. South window for a week or in the middle of your garden, in the middle of like cayenne pepper plants and St. John's wort and like fiery stones and your solar related talismans, you know, sitting there for a week under the summer sun right after the summer solstice. 
South facing window is good too. Castor oil might help if you're dealing with fresh plants and you want to minimize the antimicrobial piece. Yep. Castor oil is hard to work with a little bit. People feel like it's super oily. But if you like it, no, that's great. You can pick any oil that you'd like. Yeah. So can we put fresh plant material into oil and freeze it overnight? and thereby have the water separate off. I don't have experience with that, so I can't speak to whether it's effective or not. Have you had that be effective? I don't know if freezing oil with herb, with herb water in it would actually, or if it, the water would just freeze in with all the herbs and like not come to the bottom, right? Because water should go to the bottom. It's more dense than the oil is. So the only, I have used that process, but in reverse. For example, when extracting um, pine pitch or propolis or cannabis or other really resinous plants, if you've got a big old pot of water, you throw all your herbal material in there. And then you throw lard or coconut oil or olive oil or something like that in to that pot of water with all the herbal material, and you boil it. You boil it, you boil it, you boil it, right? And that keeps the temperature at 200 Fahrenheit, which is good, and it provides heat for the extraction. Then you take that pot of water, strain everything out, so it's now herbal extractives, oil, and water, and then you freeze that. All the oil and its extractives rise to the top and solidify, right? Or you don't even need to freeze it, you just need to put it outside in cold. So the oil solidifies, the water stays in, you poke a hole in the oil, you drain off all the water and throw it away, and you've got this amazing infused oil. So I've used that method, but I've not done the reverse, trying to separate water out of a mostly oil preparation. So I can't really speak to it. Okay, let's get into some, oh yeah. Is there any benefit to lard or other amazing things like rendered bear fat? And yes is my answer. Um, we feel like there's better penetration into the human skin from animal fats than there is from vegetable oils. Now, it's not a lot better, but if we're dealing with osteoarthritis, for example, right, making a datura seed and boswellia unguent with lard is an amazing way to do it. As long as people don't mind you know, smelling like lard or smelling like beef tallow, um, a little bit, um, which I don't personally mind. But um, a way to do that if you're vegan or vegetarian or you don't want to use animal fats um, is to use lanolin, which even though it's a, I don't think vegans can use lanolin, I'm not sure. But it is an animal product, but the sheep are not harmed. Or I, I guess it depends how you feel as a sheep from being sheared and things like that, but you're certainly not killed. So lanolin can be an animal fat-like product that can be mixed with vegetable oils to improve their penetration in human skin. All right, so a couple of um, aromatic plants that I want to share with you. The first is garlic. And I love garlic because it really encapsulates the two main things that aromatic plants can do for us. First of all, garlic kills freaking everything, <laughs> except for white rot mold, unfortunately, the fungus that attacks garlic. But viruses, bacteria, fungi, including tinea fungus responsible for ringworm and athlete's foot, all killed by garlic. It's an amazing broad spectrum antimicrobial. It does a lot of amazing stuff on things like high cholesterol and liver health too. I won't talk about that. That's a little bit of a special thing that has to do with its tonic pungent compounds. But garlic's second major thing is its ability to cause what's called diaphoresis or sweating and to do what's called vasodilation, or opening up of the blood vessels. And as a result, we use garlic for high blood pressure. Okay? Now, garlic is so hot of an aromatic plant that some people from the Ayurvedic tradition, you know, these ascetic meditating yogis, they'll say, don't eat garlic, because it's too stimulating to libido. 
I don't know if that's exactly true, but it is very hot and warming and spicy, and it does kind of like get your mind moving a little bit more, partly because it pumps your blood a little more and improves circulation so well. And I guess if you're a meditating yogi, you probably don't want that, or I don't know, maybe you don't want that. Um, that's the only sort of spirit-related caution that I've heard around garlic. There are other cautions, like too much fresh garlic will make you puke because it's really intense. Right? I totally get that. It's not an herb that we want to use with active heartburn and ulcers at very high doses. But one of the beauties of garlic's aromatic qualities is, is that if we roast it or cook it, it's still very effective as a vasodilator and an opener of circulatory function. Does that make sense? Two to three cloves a day, roasted, cooked, infused in oil. If you can do that, it's a great supplement to keep circulation strong and open and to help with blood pressure as a result. I use it primarily in this one presentation of blood pressure. Interesting that in medicine, they, they either have blood pressure that's due to something we know, like kidney disease issues, or a tumor that's secreting adrenaline, for example. And then everything else, which is the bulk of the high blood pressure that physicians see, is called idiopathic, meaning we don't know why you have high blood pressure. Herbalists get a little more subtle about it and recognize a few different patterns that connect to high blood pressure. One of the patterns that is most amenable to the use of garlic and other aromatic plants is what I call the trapped heat pattern. It's a situation where we have a hypertension or a high blood pressure, and often a lot of signs of heat here in the middle, like a loudspeaker like myself with a lot of redness in their face maybe constitutionally, but cold hands and feet, okay? and difficulty with perspiration. And if that's the case, opening the circulation to improve the temperature of the hands and feet will also distribute the blood volume more efficiently and help counteract the pressure. Does that make sense? So we use garlic as one of the stand-ins for that, um, or one of the major ways to help open up the circulation in a trapped heat hypertensive presentation. Another herb we can use, of course, is ginger. And ginger is also an amazing anti-nauseant. Right? How is it that ginger helps with nausea? We think it's because, unlike the bitters which tighten those valves, ginger relaxes those valves, and particularly relaxes the valve at the bottom of the stomach, allowing the food to leave the stomach in the appropriate direction. So the anti-nauseant effect of ginger is related to relaxing the musculature of the GI tract so that that musculature doesn't cause contractile emesis or vomiting and contribute to that feeling of nausea. The clinical research on ginger shows us that it's as effective as Dramamine for things like motion sickness, for example, right? And a ginger chew is something I bring with myself whenever I go on air travel, just in case we hit some of that turbulence on the way down, for example. Now, ginger is also used to open up circulation and to induce perspiration and to help break fevers, traditionally and historically. Okay, so start thinking about these aromatic plants and what they're up to. We can smell them. Smell does these things to our consciousness that are really interesting. And then internally, they seem to have this effect on relaxing the musculature in the circulation, relaxing the musculature in the stomach. Let's keep going. <clears throat> this is um, a little bit of um, time. And time is one of our very best antimicrobial herbs for topical use. You all know these hand sanitizers that are everywhere, right? Purell, isopropyl alcohol, 60-70%. When you look for alternative hand sanitizers that don't have alcohol in them, what do you find as the chief active agent? Thymol, the volatile oil from thyme. At concentrations of 0.5%, as opposed to the 60 or 70 percent that's found in the of isopropyl alcohol. Thyme and thymol are incredible broad spectrum sanitizing agents. So used topically for wounds, it's amazing. Not quite as antifungal as garlic is, but really good at dealing with a lot of pathogens. And so it's used internally as well. What's really neat about thymol, you see this with garlic too, is that the volatile oil is small enough, it's a monoterpene, so it's very, very volatile. So when you eat it and you absorb it into your bloodstream, one of the first places that it reaches is the lungs capillary bed where gas exchange takes place. And there, 
thymol bubbles up and out of the lungs, evaporating out through the bronchial passages and coming out on your breath. The reason you have garlic breath after eating a lot of garlic is not because it's bubbling up from your stomach. It's because that garlic's volatile constituents are in your bloodstream and it's coming up and out through the lungs. As it does so, it's sterilizing the lung passages of any potential viruses or bacteria that might be present there. So thyme is used as a tea, but also as a steam, as an aromatic inhalant, to deal with bronchopulmonary infection. Yeah? Mm. Is it true that you can put a crushed clove of garlic on your feet and you'll taste it within minutes? I don't know about within minutes, but you will get some transdermal absorption of some of the pungent constituents and aromatic constituents of garlic through the soles of your feet or through the soles of the palms of your hand or anywhere else on your body that you might put it. And I don't know if it's minutes, but you should be able to get a little bit of a sense of it on your breath, but it's coming through your lungs, not through your stomach. That's a, that's a little bit of a tangent, but yes, and it's a good point, thing to point out. Um, when you're using garlic, you want to crush it or traumatize it as much as you possibly can. You don't need to chop it really neat and thin. Just like traumatize the bejesus out of it and turn, until it turns into a pulp. And then you want to let it sit for about five minutes. The reason being is that the pungent compounds require activation by an enzyme, and the pungent compound precursor and the enzyme are in two separate compartments in the garlic clove. Traumatizing it mixes the enzyme with the precursor, activates the pungent allicin, which is medicinal antimicrobial. So traumatize it, let it sit for about five minutes, then cook with it or eat it or infuse it or whatever it is you want to do, rub it on the soles of your feet. Now, thyme is also used to um, induce sweating in a fever, as well as being antimicrobial. So some of the same qualities you see from other aromatic plants are also found in thyme. This is fennel, and fennel comes to us in a couple of different ways. Um, I grew up eating the bulb of sweet fennel, chopped up and put into salad, again, maybe with some radicchio and a little bit of olive oil, and maybe something sweet like a pomegranate seed, right? Look at what you're doing when you do that. But fennel is classically considered what's called a carminative, or something that helps with the gas. And that can be the bulb or it can be the seed. Fennel seeds are typically found on the outgoing of Indian food restaurants, where there's a little dish of fennel seeds that you can grab a pinch of to chew. Why? It helps you burp and relieves gas pressure in this incredible way. How does it do that? The aromatic volatiles like anethole and fenchol and estragol that are found in fennel seed and fennel bulb get into your system and relax the musculature around the GI tract, all of those bands of muscle. And what is gas pain except a gas bubble that's trapped between two contracted areas of muscle, and then there's this gas bubble inside it. It feels awful. So if you can equalize the tension of the muscles in the GI tract by relaxing them a little bit, then the gas gets to move around. It doesn't feel like this bloated, pressured thing. Many times you'll fart or you'll burp or both, and boy, that feels good if you're over full, right? So aromatic, carminative plants are used to relax the gut smooth muscle to allow gas pressure to equalize and just make people feel better. That's often the reason why they're added to the bitter, right? because it's great to have that one-two combo of something that stimulates digestive function and causes contractility of the muscles with something that also relaxes the muscles so that the gut can hedge its bets a little bit and achieve the optimal level of tone and tension as necessary for that individual person. One of my favorite aromatic plants is linden. Oh, did you have a comment? Yeah. Thyme and fennel, raw or cooked. And seeds, pinch raw. No need to cook them. Fennel bulb, I prefer it raw. But you can certainly cook it, although it loses some of its aromatic quality. With thyme, fresh in a wound is ideal. But you can certainly cook with it, although some of its medicinal activity will be lost because the heat dissipates those volatile oils. And remember, right, terpenes, anyone ever heard this word? Terpene? A class of molecules that's very small, light, volatile. That's what we're talking about being part of the medicinal quality of all these aromatic plants. Essential oils are made up of terpenes, mono and sesquiterpenes, 
10 and 15 carbon atom molecules, and phenylpropanoids like eugenol from clove. The smell of clove is a phenylpropanoid, but also a volatile molecule, all present in the essential oil. So all of these plants are terpene rich. These are volatile molecules. If you heat the bejesus out of them, they're going to leave into the air. Okay? Part of the reason why we want the lid on the infused oil if we're going to infuse an aromatic plant. Okay? So linden. So these trees were planted all throughout Central and Eastern Europe. This is like, it's on all the currency in the Czech Republic. Okay? Lipa, the linden tree. Tilleul in the south of France. Milled linden soap and linden baths, right? Lavender and linden, they're the main aromatics of sort of classic French perfumery. It has this smell that's so subtle and unique and floral, I love it. In Burlington, they bloom like first week of July. Typically, they'll bloom around the summer solstice, and this smell floods the streets. And you're walking late at night, and it's like that warm summer night that's kind of humid, and you round a corner, and whoosh, this aromatic like spirit flows from the linden trees and hits your nose, and you're like, wow, I'm a human on this planet? How did I get so lucky? Anyway, the volatile in particular is called Farnazol, and it's relatively unique to this linden. And so that characteristic floral smell that you get is super amazing. You want to pick them flower and bract as soon as they open. They start getting like syrupy and narcotic and not quite as sweet smelling as the age of the flower progresses. But if you get them, you can infuse them into oil or you can make a tea out of them. And linden is considered to be a nervous system calmative, also helpful to open up the circulation and used in blood pressure. But mostly it's for stress and anxiety, okay? Mostly it's for stress and anxiety. And so we're converging on some interesting actions from these aromatic plants as mediated by the volatile oils they contain. They seem to be able to open circulation by relaxing arterial smooth muscle. They seem to be able to equalize gas pressure in the gut by relaxing gastrointestinal smooth muscle. Sometimes they're used topically to kill things, and a lot of those volatile oils are broadly antimicrobial. And then they have this smell that grabs our consciousness in a very unique way. Finally, many of our aromatic plants, like linden, are also used for nervous system issues like anxiety and tension and stress. And my contention is that the combination of smell bringing you into the present moment plus opening up of the circulation and relaxing of the GI tract is a threefold combination that is very useful for stress. Now we tend to use plants that are more floral and quote unquote cooling as opposed to plants like garlic for stress and tension, but there's applicability for garlic in stress and tension too, particularly if that person has poor circulation and really cold hands and feet. But linden absolutely is one of them. And of course, so is rose. Yeah? So the question is, is the linden that grows in New England the same as the linden that grows in Europe? And there are a lot of species of linden. There's a hybrid version of Tilia cordata and Tilia platyphyllos that's called Tilia cross europea. And that's the little leaf linden and one of the most commonly used ones. But we also have Tilia platyphyllos, which is a commonly used species of linden that is really good, um, that grows here. There's the American basswood, Tilia americana, which is native to here. Its flower doesn't smell quite as good. And my problem with the American basswood is it grows to like 100 feet tall. You can't pick the flowers even if they did smell good. But the smaller linden species of Europe stay more manageable, and you can climb them and get into those flower branches really easily. And finally, there's a third one that I really love called the silver leaf linden, or Tilia tomentosa. And it has these big, beefy, delicious smelling flowers that last for a really long time. And you can usually find those around here, too. Yes, sir. So um, the comment here is that in certain Polish delis, you find not only the linden flower and bract, but you also find the linden leaves. And early summer, late spring, early summer linden leaves can be used as grape leaves 
for like making dolmas and things like that. They're tender, not super fibrous, really delicious, lightly steamed, so good. But the linden flower and bract is the part that's used as medicine as an anti-stress circulatory opener aromatic. So rose is another example, um, again, of an aromatic plant that's used. And herbalists use rose for soothing the nervous, nervous system, particularly after trauma you know, or, or literal heartbreak. Um, rose can really help soothe and support that. It also is an herb that improves circulation. It's one of the more astringent aromatics, so it's particularly indicated if people also maybe have some heartburn or something like that. Broken heart plus heartburn. It's not as uncommon of a combo as you might think. Um, anyway, rose is applicable in those cases. And then, of course, we couldn't talk about aromatic plants without talking about lavender. And so lavender is one of my favorites. The issue with lavender, if anyone's ever tried to make tea out of this plant, is that it's pretty bitter, right? Really hard to take a big mug full of lavender tea. But if you make a lavender tincture, right, you get a little bit of that bitterness too. But I can introduce you to this really interesting technique which is to take a tincture that you've made and you've strained and distill it. How do you do that? If you're lucky enough to have a still, right, you can just put it in there, send it through the condenser coil, and recover the spirit. Otherwise, another way you can do it is by um, putting a um, mason jar and essentially drilling a half-inch hole in here, putting a rubber, rubber gasket in it, running some copper coil that's used for like um, water supply for refrigerators off of it, and then putting that copper coil through the same half inch hole with gasket into another mason jar. This you put into a simmering water bath on the stove. This you put over on the side. The steam comes out. Ideally, you'd cool the copper coil, but if it's all sealed, that's not necessary. And so what you get over here is what? Vapors of ethanol plus all of the volatiles of lavender. And what's left behind? all the fixed bitter constituents. It's not a hydrosol anymore because we started with a tincture rather than starting with water. But if you use this process with water and lavender flowers, what you get on the other side is a hydrosol. But what I love about the tincture first is that it really draws out all of those volatile chemicals. And then distilling it, you leave behind all of the fixed bitter stuff. So all you're left with is the lovely volatile aromatic qualities of lavender without any of its bitterness. That can be dosed in drops of one to five drops as needed under the tongue to help with gas, bloating, opening up circulation, or dealing with stress or tension. In this pharmacy in Florence called the Apothecary of Santa Maria Novella, they have this thing called hysterical water that they make. And they call it hysterical water because it was for hysteria. And hysteria, it's actually a really interesting word. Probably a lot of you know about the etymology of this word, but it comes from the Greek word uter, which means womb or uterus. So the root word in Greek for hysterical and for uterus is the same. And the reason for that is, is that People with uteruses were taught, thought to be the hysterical ones, right? People without uteruses are certainly very unemotional and rational people, right? And that when the uterus was acting up, that's when you got uterusy or hysterical. Very interesting stuff. And it was thought that what you needed was something to calm your uterus down. Now, I'm really going to push back against that you know, pseudoscientific medical theory, because it's totally not true. But nevertheless, it does point to the fact that stress and tension, which we might put under the rubric of hysteria, anxiety and frazzledness, can be ameliorated by aromatic plants. But it's not because they do something magical to the uterus, though they do. It's more because they open and relax the circulation and they relax the musculature of the GI tract, and they smell really good, so they bring us in the present moment. All of these things are anti-stress. All of these things promote relaxation. Now, on the uterine tangent, it's really interesting, right? So aromatic plants are infused into oils, and they're used for people who are experiencing menstrual cramps topically, rubbed on the lower back or rubbed here in the pelvic area of the abdomen. Those volatile oils relax smooth muscle. So if you've got a cramping uterus, that's giving you some distress, relaxing that muscular contraction makes it feel better. 
right? So aromatic plants have always been used topically as well as somewhat internally to help with things like menstrual cramping. And maybe that's where they got this whole uterusy thing. I'm not sure. But what's fascinating to note is they're completely contraindicated in pregnancy. No time in pregnancy. Maybe a little bit of fennel, but some of our stronger aromatics like clove or even tulsi, you don't want to use in pregnancy. Really high doses of garlic, not okay in pregnancy. Ginger might be an exception to that, right? It's really good for morning sickness and has been used safely. But our stronger aromatic plants can actually initiate uterine contractions in a pregnant person, which is not what you want to do. Does that make sense? So let me, what's that? Correct. <laughs> yes, no, I'm talking about week 15. Now, um, let me just finish this thought and then I'll take a couple of comments. The point is that these volatile oils, has anyone ever put tea tree oil in their eyeball? <laughs> you laugh, why? It would be, uh, it would destroy your eyeball. It's super painful. Why is it that these aromatic plants essential oils kill bacteria and viruses and fungi? They melt them, right? These monoterpenes are so oily and so penetrative. What's turpentine? It's the distilled spirit of pine trees. It's essential oil. It thins paint. It acts as an industrial solvent. This stuff is intense when it's concentrated. Okay, so small amounts even are somewhat irritating to muscle. So if a muscle is relaxed to the max and you apply some volatile oil to it, even in small concentrations, it actually stimulates it to contract a little bit. Then after that, you get a relaxant effect. And that comes, we think, through mild blockage of what are called calcium channels. These calcium channels are important for making that musculature contract. If you've ever heard of the drug calcium channel blockers for high blood pressure, you'll see that mildly blocking calcium channels with aromatics can be useful for blood pressure. So you get this initial sort of spasmogenic irritative effect, and then you get this prolonged relaxant effect. The initial spasmogenic effect doesn't matter much if someone is experiencing uterine cramping. The uterus is spazzing out already, right? What predominates is the relaxant secondary effect. You get that? Now, if you're pregnant, the uterus is totally not spazzing. In fact, it's relaxed and stretched out. And small amounts of something that might trigger a little irritation, even if it's followed by relaxation, might be enough to get that uterus triggered into contracting and causing miscarriage. And that's what we don't want. So it's this biphasic time response that comes from these aromatic plants. At first, a little initial spasmogenicity, then that's followed by relaxation. So essentially, it takes the musculature inside the body and stretches it out like a rubber band a couple times and then lets it find its own optimal tension level. So what I talk about these plants doing is restoring neuromuscular tone to our insides. And the brain actually perceives that as a situation of low stress. And that's how they end up having positive effects on things like anxiety, stress, and nervous tension. OK, there were a couple comments. Uh, just Brenda might really look about the reason for so many people who do diet. So the comment is that overdoing ginger in pregnancy might actually be a problem. Yeah, she said Small amounts of ginger relieve nausea for things like morning sickness. But yes, if you overdo it, you might be exposing a super stretched out non-contractile uterus to an amount of volatiles that is enough to get that uterus to start contracting. So that's a good point. You have to be careful. Yes? So the question is, if some of these herbs like thyme, which we use for treating bronchitis or flu or colds, can't be used in pregnancy, what types of herbs can we use in pregnancy to deal with those types of things? And pregnancy is tough. And usually, I like to have a conversation with a midwife who's experienced in the use of medicinal herbs, because I'm not a pregnancy specialist. I've never been pregnant. And I don't really like 
my, it's not my main field of expertise, so I love to consult with someone who has more experience than I do. But that said, you can use strategies like elderberry that bolster immune function and have antiviral effects but are not contraindicated in pregnancy. And you can even use echinacea, believe it or not, which seems to be safe in a pregnancy situation um, if you'd like. So using the strong volatile oil-based antimicrobials or the berberin-based antimicrobials like barberry and golden seal, that's not okay. But you can use some other immunologic tonics um, or antiviral herbs like echinacea or elderberry if you want. Or you can use things like hot compresses of ginger on the forehead or ginger rubs on the back, right, close to the lungs, keeping them away from down here. And that can give you a way to get some of those aromatics to that local area, not necessarily because they're antimicrobial there, but because they relax and help with breathing maybe. Could a hot compress go on the chest? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to use tons and tons. You don't want to use neat essential oils. But if you're using a whole herb like ginger um, or even thyme applied as a compress on the chest during pregnancy, that's OK. You just don't want to drink lots of that tea internally if you can help it. Yeah. And if you decided you did want to induce, uh, <laughs> stop the pregnancy. Stop the pregnancy. Yeah. Would so safe? herbalists, I will say this, historically, the herbalist served often as overlapping function of midwife, often in the past. And in many cases, herbalists were called upon for, I don't have a better word for this, abortifacient herbs, herbs that would terminate a pregnancy. That's a risky strategy, partly because many of the herbs that are abortifacient, like mugwort or wormwood or yarrow, contain volatile molecules and other components that are also teratogenic or causative of birth defects, which means that if you don't successfully terminate the pregnancy, you could harm the embryo or fetus without actually terminating the pregnancy. So I'm really reluctant to make any recommendations around the use of herbs for abortifacient purposes, except to say that historically, that's definitely something herbalists would do, and there definitely are preparations that will cause the expulsion of an unwanted pregnancy that are based in medicinal plants. I don't want to offer any advice in that regard right now. It's a very personal question, and it's something that should be done um, through intimate work with an herbalist, ideally uh, an herbalist who has experienced pregnancy, um, working one-on-one. -on -one. Oh man, the question is, can you capture lilac? I struggle, struggle, struggle with capturing lilac. It's so hard to do. You can make a tincture of it, you can make an infused oil of it, it doesn't smell like anything. The best thing that I've come up with is to take those fresh lilac flowers and put them in a jar and cover them, I kid you not, with granulated white sugar. For some reason, it dehydrates the lilacs really quickly and draws the traces of volatiles that are present in the lilac into that sugar. And then you can just put a little bit of that in some hot water to make instant tea. And it smells like lilac for about 10 seconds, and then it's gone. <laughs> so it's hard. I wish I could capture lilac a little better. Yeah. Yeah, infused honey is also really good, too. Um, for some reason, it didn't capture the lilac as well as the granulated white sugar did. Okay, the last one I want to um, talk about in terms of aromatics is Tulsi or holy basil. And um, I'm just going to, while I talk about the holy basil, I'm going to pour off a little bit of this tincture. Now, whenever you've made a tincture, um, any, of those, any of you who have done so, um, how long are you supposed to steep a tincture for? Six weeks. A month, a lunar cycle, as long as you want. OK. I'm here to tell you that we don't have to really steep tinctures that long if we don't want to. You can steep them as long as you want to if you'd like. The herbs will stay stable in there for five years. There, is, there are some herbs where you may not want to steep them very long. And I do believe the aromatic herbs are one of those classes of herbs. You can make a really good aromatic herbal tincture that you steep for 48 hours. I don't know if I would go longer than a week. 
I mean, you can, and it's fine. But what happens as you steep tinctures longer is you start to get more bitter and astringent constituents. The volatile oils, think about where they're present. They're present on trichomes, right on the outer surface of the leaf. They dissolve into that alcohol in the matter of hours or even minutes. It's the other stuff, the tannins, the astringent components, the bitter components that take longer. Anyone ever heard of quinine, Peruvian bark? Chinchona is the source of the alkaloid quinine, which is the chief bittering agent in tonic water. If you get Peruvian bark and you want to use it to make your homemade tonic water, which is totally easy to do, by the way, I refer you to my book, DIY Bitters. But if you steep that Peruvian bark for a week, it's going to taste muddy, super astringent. If you steep it for one day or even 12 hours, all you get is the quinine. And it's clean and bitter and awesome. So there is some subtlety in tincture steeping, particularly if you want to avoid astringent or bitter tasting compounds. Steep it for a short period of time, which works great for aromatic plants. Okay? If you steep a peppermint tincture for six weeks, it's going to be astringent. If you steep it for six hours, it's going to be pure menthol. And that's all you're really going to get. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're talking about using time, not the herb, but the fourth dimension, to um, <coughs> fractionate the chemistry of the plant. And any time you fractionate the chemistry of the plant, you're not dealing with whole plant anymore. And there's definitely pitfalls to that. And that means excluding some of the chemistry, which might be part of an entourage effect for that plant, or might be an important synergist. If the point is like, could you have four different jars? One is only extracted for a day, one is extracted for a week, one is extracted for two weeks, one for a month. If you leave it for a month, you're going to get all the constituents. You don't need to specifically only leave it for a day to get the menthol or get the quinine. That will all come in the first day. And then in the first week, you'll get another slew of constituents. And in the first month, you'll pretty much get 95% of all the constituents. Um, tincture extraction is a, like a logarithmic curve. Kind of looks like this, right? You get a lot at the beginning, and then sort of a law of diminishing returns as the extraction continues. Um, but really, what I found by researching this and actually doing chemical analysis of the extracts is that unless we want to, we don't need to steep tinctures for a month. And what I'd like to do now is just pour off some of this Tulsi tincture. I foolishly did not bring my stainless steel mesh strainer. But I'm just going to pour it off. And even if there's some plant material, it's going to be all right. What? Oh, that's OK. Just You'll have to bear with me even if there's some plant material in here. So I don't know how long this is steeped. Maybe like two and a half, three hours? Not much more than that. Um, this is Krishna Tulsi. So it's green. <coughs> Has an interesting smell. If you feel brave, right, feel free to pour a little bit into a glass that you might have or even, even just into the palm of your hand. Remembering that it's 150 proof. But let's pass it around and get a little sense. What you'll notice is eugenol, that clove-like smell, along with a lovely mintiness and almost basil-like quality. What you won't notice is any astringency at all. And if you were to steep this for a month, it would be astringent. It would be darker. It would taste a little stronger. But you'd have a lot of tannin and a lot of the organic acids. Now, those are still useful material to have in a tincture. But if all you want is the aromatic quality to deal with stress and tension and anxiety, you don't need to steep your tincture for a full month. Does that make sense? OK. So just to summarize our aromatic plants, they often have a strong antiseptic quality. 
They kill things. The reason being, they are loaded with these monoterpenes that are amazing solvents, like turpentine. Okay? They modulate spasm, tension, and mood all across the physiology. So all our aromatic plants, they make you burp, they help you fart, they make your gut more relaxed, they open up the circulation by relaxing arterial smooth muscle. Those are all common things. And so if you look at the old herbals, aromatic plants are used for fever, they're used to encourage sweating and perspiration, they're used for GI tract gas and bloating, and they're used for stress and nervous tension. Okay? So the traditional uses are to burn them or to just sniff them or to make hot teas for perspiration because, of course, a hot tea will synergize with the aromatic vasodilative qualities. Our modern research is looking at their support for cardiovascular health and for stress and mood. If you looked at the research base for lavender, for example, it's extensive on helping modulate things like anxiety and nervous tension and stress. We also can use them topically as well as internally, and massage therapists know that aromatic oils added to a massage oil is really good for opening circulation to muscles and relaxing tension in muscles. Okay? I find them tonic because they are modulators of the level of tension in the smooth muscle across the body stretching out that rubber band and helping it find that optimal point of tension. This information, we talked about the vagus nerve, right? The vagus nerve is not a one-way street. It does not merely take information from the brain and send it down to the body. It also takes information from the body and sends it up to the brain. And where in the brain does that information go? It goes to the hypothalamus, which is just under the thalamus, which is part of the limbic system. That same place that is immediately activated by the perception of an aromatic smell. So the synergy of information coming up from the body, which says, level of tension, low. The perception of a smell that brings you into the present moment, those synergize to help us release stress and the perception of stress, making us feel less anxious and less frazzled. And when taken consistently over time, they have this great rebalancing effect on our perception of stress. So where adaptogenic tonics are used long term to change our hormone response to stress, aromatic plants are used short term in the moment to help with feelings of tension, frazzledness, lack of focus, and anxiety. And they work pretty quickly for that purpose without being psychotropic. That's what I love. It's like we're tricking the brain into feeling non-stressed by relaxing the internal tension in all of our smooth muscle, rather than working on the neurotransmitters or whatever. Does that make sense? I think that's a great sneaky way to make people feel more relaxed. Work on the soma, and the psyche will follow. Because of course, they're really one thing. OK? So any questions or comments on that? Yeah. And the Tulsi tincture. So the question is, are we missing something by having aromatics and not tannins? And yes, we are. We absolutely are. But um, so, so Tulsi is also known as an anti-inflammatory and as an adaptogen, an, inhibita an inhibitor of the COX-2 enzyme, which creates series 2 prostaglandins. That's not happening from the volatiles. So if that's what you're after, this tincture ain't going to do it because it's the phenolic acids and some of those other later eluding constituents that are responsible for that, right? But if you want something that helps relieve stress and tension, can be mixed into a cocktail, can be mixed with aromatic, um, can be mixed with sparkling water, for stress and anxiety purposes, this tincture is great. But I completely agree with you. We're definitely fractionating things, right? And that's a dangerous road to go down. You know, at the very least, I can tell you that there's a whole cocktail and synergy of different aromatic constituents here. It's not a single molecule at the very least. But yes, you're right. Um, in some cases, though, it's, it's worth having that because we really want to focus only in one particular direction. In this case, the modulation of tension, anxiety, and nervous stress, for example. So would you just You could, yeah, except for now that I've poured some off, there's a bunch of herbal material sticking out of my alcohol, right? And that's not ideal. It's going to start turning black. Nothing's going to grow in it because it's saturated with 140 proof ethanol. But still, it'll oxidize and get weird and maybe create some off flavors, right? 
So you could have two different Tulsi tinctures. You make your stress nerving Tulsi tincture, steeping it for a day. And then you make your anti-inflammatory Tulsi tincture that you steep for four weeks. Yeah. Uh huh. Is there any sort of communication through the plants or through? I'm thinking, is that open up people to being more receptive to <coughs> tea? Because sometimes the herbal teas okay. um, are are more um, more challenging for people if they haven't been exposed to them. So, would an environmental aromatic help? And is monk fruit a better sweetener than some of the others? We got a, we got a lot of questions. So the one is, can we, do, can we incorporate aromatics into people's lives by just putting a rosemary plant in that room or using an aromatherapy diffuser or something that is environmental rather than taken internally? For people who have a hard time or for whatever reason can't use alcohol-based extracts or teas, yes. And that's what aromatherapy does for us, right? And there's a lot of research backing the idea that we can volatilize Mole terpene molecules into the air, inhale them, and it modulates our mood in a positive way. It also makes us feel more relaxed, and it may make us feel more open to actually moving into a tea after that. I do think that if we're talking about diet and nutrition, introducing someone to bitterness is almost more important, but especially if you're working with incarcerated folks, the idea of nervous system support and stress and tension is a really important one. And a lot of times people make poor dietary choices because they're under stress um, or because they are self-medicating with food to try and relieve that stress and tension and making some questionable choices in that regard. So I think using environmental diffusion of volatile molecules um, for stress and tension is useful and effective and sounds like a great idea. Now, monk fruit is a good alternative sweetener um, it's not like stevia in the sense that its flavor is different, but it's like stevia in the sense that it doesn't really have calories. It provides an artificial perception of sweetness without actually being caloric. So I totally support using that, and um, different types of monk fruit extracts are available that you can bake with, for example. Um, but if you want to make a tea taste better, you can put just a trace of monk, monk fruit or stevia in with your tea mix, and it tastes sweet, and people like that. So I, I support that as well. Um, yeah. Microphone? Okay. Yes. Oh, great. The question is, what about red clover for sweetness to modulate bitterness? Is it caloric? And the answer is not really. It's not really caloric, but it does have so much nectar. Yes, but it's so very little that I don't think we're too worried about that. Red clover in a tea, you know, being a uh, source of hidden calories. Um, it's also not incredibly sweet, you know, but it is, I agree, it sweetens up blends in a really nice way. A couple of other comments, yes? Sir. Yes, we found that all of these secondary plant metabolites, including aromatic terpenes, as well as bitter flavonoids, lactones, and other bitter compounds, are, increase, are eluded in increasing quantity um, when plants are under stress. Aromatics, we think, in part because they're a signal to other plants that browsing has happened, that there's been damage to the leaf, damage to the trichome, the volatiles travel across the air. If there's a bacterial damage, it might help sterilize or fight that infection just like it does for us. But if it's an insect or an herbivore, the volatile travels across the air to a neighboring plant which is actually able to perceive that and upregulate its defensive um, strategies in response. So we see under stress and damage that plants make more volatile terpenes as well as the bitter constituents that we were talking about earlier. Increasing the mineral content may limit the phytochemical. I can't speak to the mineral piece. I don't have data on the tip of my tongue there. What I can tell you is that reducing irrigation and reducing nitrogen while maintaining carbon 
does lead to greater secondary metabolite production. And that science, I would say, is conclusive. And, and there's a huge body of evidence showing that simple, like drought stress, dramatically increases the production of secondary metabolites, including aromatic volatiles and bitter tasting compounds. Yeah, thank you. Yes? It's a good question. Yeah. So generally, the principles are, you know, respect and trust the living system, focus on support over control, and greater diversity in a living system tends to make that system more resilient. So increasing the menu of options for the human physiology, which is what you're referring to, is a really good strategy. So the question is, if we're trying to deal with stress and nervous tension, should we go for a range of different aromatic plants and, like, change it up and provide a lot of diversity? I think if you like doing that, that's great, okay? And also different delivery systems. What about a bath? What about aromatherapy in the room? What about transdermal application of oils? What about teas? You can deliver aromatics in so many different ways. But every single aromatic plant already is a crazy diversity of aromatic chemistry, all on its own. So I don't think it's really necessary. I think this is one of the situations where it's important to have one or two aromatics in your life, and you should pick the one that you like the best. So I could drink lemon balm tea. I could drink Tulsi tea. But the aromatic that I like the most, when I've put my kid down for bed, and it's time to switch hats and start doing some writing, is linden. And that's one of the things that I love about aromatics. We live in a crazy multitasking world. We're expected to switch our attention constantly. Switching our attention is really, really hard for us to do. I don't know if you all have followed the research on productivity and multitasking and how they're really not compatible and how the human brain is not designed to multitask or to task switch very frequently and how, you know, thanks to these things that uh, while I do love them, right, they definitely impinge on our consciousness and their information in 20,000 different directions switching all the time, notifying us all the time. I'm not going to get into what to do with our cell phones, but one of the things that does help us switch are aromatic plants. And if I sit down to write after putting my kid to bed without having linden tea, it's going to be half an hour of like reading the news, checking my email, and seeing what just got posted on the Urban Moonshine Facebook page and if I have to deal with it or not. If I have linden tea, I'm brought into the present moment, and all those things now start to seem like distractions keeping me from my goal of coming up with a good piece of writing. So in this multitasking world where we're drawn in a thousand different directions all at once, and where people, I'm telling you, in the next 20 years, people who can focus for three hours at a time are going to become incredibly valuable. <laughs> So, to make yourself valuable, consider the use of aromatic plants, because that's exactly what they help us do. They help us switch hats and transition. That's part of why they're used in ceremony, okay? That's really part of why they're used in ceremony. And they can help us move from one part of our day to the next part of the day with greater grace and mindfulness. They're certainly great adjuncts to any mindfulness preparation or um, program that you might be engaged in. I'm going to take one more comment, and then I want to finish up. So I work for this tea company called Traditional Medicinals. <clears throat> I would rather you get pine needles from a pine tree fresh and make tea out of them for its aromatic purposes. And part of the reason for that is, and I love Traditional Medicinals and you know, knowing the ins and outs of the quality work that goes into making those teas, I stand fully behind their quality, their potency, and their efficacy. But almost any national tea company uses herbs that have been steam treated by, almost by law at this point, the aphysma. And if you steam treat an aromatic plant, you're going to lose a chunk of the volatile chemistry that is so amazing and responsible for its fragrance and its medicinal efficacy. 
So if you can find a tea company that doesn't steam treat their herbs, or you can find a local herbalist who stashed some linden away, great. But even linden that's bought on um, the open market through a company like Mountain Rose, it's going to be steam treated. So again, because there's a lot of crossover with these aromatic plants, you can get pine needles or spruce tips and make a vitamin C rich tea that is also an amazing aromatic that accomplishes a lot of the things we're talking about here. And you get it and it's fresh and it's vibrant and it's real. Did you have a quick comment? Well, you're about to get into tonics. I was just wondering yeah. if you could touch on, on asthma and you mentioned uh, for, for I, We're not going to be able to get into tonics, my friends. But let me at least show you um, a little bit of what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about green tea and camellia with its epigallocatechin gallate and its catechins that are responsible for cardiovascular protection. And of course, the blueberries and hawthorn berries that are also responsible for cardiovascular protection, which fall under the sour tonics category, OK? That are good for cardiovascular health primarily. <clears throat> the next class of tonics that I want to talk about are the sweet ones, which include herbs like astragalus root, ginseng, codonopsis, and I'm going to throw the mushrooms like shiitake and reishi mushroom in there as well. What these sweet tonics do for us is provide immunologic balance and also balance to our stress hormones, particularly the hormones involved in our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gland axis. So they modulate our hormonal response to stress, where the aromatics respond our, um, modulate our nervous system and muscular tension response to stress. Okay? So they make a great combination together. And um, I'll leave you here with a picture of the Fairy Hills of Noth in Ireland. And the reason I leave you with this is because there's this amazing Irish legend, right? The legend of um, Miach and Armed. And these were brother and sister um, in the Tuatha de Danann, the shining people of Ireland. And the shining people of Ireland came to the shores of Ireland a long time ago. And they found this race of folk there called the Firbolg. And they got into this crazy war with the Firbolg, right? And... King Nuada of the Tuatha de Danann had his hand chopped off by one of the warriors of the Firbolg. And Breed, the ruler queen and priestess of the Tuatha de Danann, she said, a king with no hand cannot rule. This is not a good thing in the middle of a war. So they called on Diane Kecht, the chief healer of the Tuatha de Danann, and they said, hey, what can you do for Nuada's hand? It's been chopped off. And Breed says, he can't be our king. We need a king to lead the army. And Diane Kecht, who pride, had a lot of pride about his healing abilities, said, well, I can't reattach a body part if it's been severed. But I'll make you a silver hand that works just as well as your original one. And they made the silver hand, and they reattached it, and it totally moved, and he could hold his sword. But Breed said, it's not real. It doesn't count. He still can't lead the people. So Diane Kecht was at a standstill. So he turned to his son, Miach, who was also an amazing healer. And Miach said, well, I think I can do something. And Miach took his sister, Armid, and they went out to the battlefield, and they found Nuada's severed hand. And over the course of three days, in like deep incantations and magic, they actually were able to reattach Nuada's hand to his arm, and it worked perfectly. They restored the king, and he was able to go out and fight again. Diane Kecht was really pissed off about this because his son had totally upstaged him. So he took his son into the middle of the council of the Tuatha de Danann and said, if you're really a healer, you need to undergo my test. And he pulled out his sword and he swung it at his son's neck and went like halfway through. And Miak took a while, focused, and healed the wound on his neck from the first cut. Diane Kecht got even more aggravated. He took a second swing at his son's neck, and he went three quarters of the way through. And Miak took a little longer, he settled in, and he was able to heal his neck, right? Diane Kecht is now livid, and so he takes all the strength that he has and just fully severs his son's head completely from his body, and Miak's head tumbles off into the green grass there. He was not able to heal that wound, and his sister, Ahmed, as well as everyone else, devastated. They all ran away from that horrible murder site of son being killed by his father. But Ahmed 
came back quickly and stayed there with her son's body, and she sat with her brother's body, and she sang to it, and she sang to it, and she sang to it every day without eating, just drinking rainwater as it fell on the green hills of Ireland, until after a month, Miak's body decomposed into the ground, and out of his body sprang the thousand healing herbs that we use to take care of ourselves in this crazy world. And Armid collected them one by one and sang the name of each one as she collected it and put it into her cloak. And as she was doing this, Diane Kecht finally, a month later, came back to the site of his homicide. And when he saw what had happened, and that his daughter had collected the healing herbs that grew even in death out of his son's body, such an amazing healer he was, his anger came back in full force, and he took his daughter's cloak and he threw it and scattered all the herbs into the air. But fortunately, Ahmed had sung to each one and had named each one and learned each one. And she ran away from the Tuatha de Danann and went to live in the hills of Killarney. And many say that she still lives there today, teaching the Irish people how to use medicinal plants and how to bring them into their lives in good and positive ways. I think the spirit of Ahmed lives inside all of us. All we need to do is get out into our gardens and encourage these plants to come back. What we need to move away from is the resentment and anger that come from the wounds we experience. And the attempt to fix those wounds with technology instead of with the true hand, the real live biology. Not that technology can't be applied but that the true path to healing comes from this reconnection to the deep biology and to the ecology in which we evolved. Armand knew this, and that's why the healing plants grew at her feet. We all know this, and just like with sustainable design in our cities, I mean, we have sustainable design in our medicine and in our gardens. I thank you for coming, for listening to me, and I hope that this message resonates out into all the communities and ecological spaces that you inhabit. Thank you very much.